This video contains subject matter that may be offensive and disturbing to some people. If you are the type to require a warning throughout a video or show, let this message serve as your warning. This channel discusses the harsh reality of true crime. If this warning is not sufficient for you, consider a different genre and unsubscribe from my channel immediately. Yo, trying to get my uh, audio fixed here, hold on. Where is it, where is it? Quit working right before. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. You know, that's just one step above stupid. There we go. <laughs> Let me try one more thing. I'm trying to get my audio to work, the little sa my sounds and everything. All right, so just close it down. Now we try to open it back up again. Yeah, we're gonna be going over Farian uh, Wardrip. <laughs> you know, that's one that you haven't really heard of, I'm sure. And there'll be nobody here tonight uh, in terms of numbers because it's all about what you know and what you're interested in. Well, that's okay though. At least we're not covering the, uh, well, first of all, the breaking news in the uh, Brian Laundry saga is that there is no new information. And yet you can still, if you practice hard enough, do a four hour live stream covering a case that has no new information. It's amazing. It's incredible. You can just follow people around as they walk the streets pretending they're looking for Brian Laundry, and it's really absolutely incredible. All right, let's see if we can if this work. Ah, okay, good. Now there's sound effects. In case I need to use them. And the same wackadoodles are out there going to the house and making a scene just for popularity. They have no um, altruism or altruistic thought process whatsoever. It's purely for sensationalism. They couldn't give two shits about the case. Okay, so whenever you see that stuff, don't look at it and say, wow, that's so neato. Um, and, and the only YouTubers that appreciate that kind of garbage, going to the homes of victims and screaming and chanting and creating a scene are people that that's their content for the day. So they're really happy to have those people. Okay, because I, I think it's disgusting and, you know, sadly, YouTube um, rewards that type of behavior. It's sick. Sickening. Good job, YouTube. Way to go. 
All right, so we're going to be doing, right now we're going to be going over Farian Wardrip, a serial killer from 1984 to 1986. Yeah, 1984 to 86. All right, and I haven't mapped it all out yet, so uh, we'll be doing that as we go. You guys ready? <laughs> just had to get my two cents in on the uh, the craziness out there. It's very, it's just absolutely disgusting and shameful. Okay, it's not my opinion; it's factual. It's a fact that it's disgusting and shameful. Okay. All right, okay. Uh, here we go. All right, so here's just kind of you know how it started back in the newspapers back in the day, you know. It, not you don't even know what you know, just another killing, another killing. So this is the very first one. A 20-year-old Midwestern State University student was stabbed to death at a rent house at 1509 Bell today, according to Major Charles uh, Trainham. So I actually have that. That one is mapped out. Right here. So this is the house that she was stabbed to death in. Right there. And that looks like that's probably been there. That's old. The woman, an employee of Bethania Regional Healthcare Center, was identified by police as Terry Sims, a sophomore elementary education major at MSU. And this is in um, Texas. Uh, Trainham said the woman had been stabbed several times and that her hands had been tied behind her back. Trainham said the woman was nude, but he would not speculate on whether she had been raped. Well, <laughs> that's pretty obvious. You don't have to speculate on that. Trainham said the woman who was renting the house, Lisa Boone, discovered the body when she returned home from work. She also was employed at Bethania, Trainham said. It looks like she was killed between 12.30 a.m. and 4 a.m. Lisa had worked all night and she found the body when she returned home at 7 to 7.30 a.m. Uh, she went in and saw uh, what had happened and ran out the door screaming. She went to a neighbor's house and then called the police. W.C. Walbrick, who rents the house to Boone, said he went into the house and actually discovered the body. I looked in the bath. I wonder why she was over at that house, the Terry Sims. I looked in the bathroom and saw a big pool of blood. Blood was splattered in the living room, and furniture was overturned. So that means she was actively trying to get away from the person as she was being stabbed and bleeding all over the place. The body will be sent to. I mean, that what a nightmare. Jeez. The the body will be sent to Dallas for an autopsy. We don't really know the cause of death, but we assume it was from stab wounds. It looks like she was lying on, on her side, Walbrick said. She didn't appear to have any clothes on. I looked in the bathroom and I got out. I didn't hear anything unusual, Walbrick said. I couldn't tell if the house had been broken into. The door has three or four locks on it. It also has a burglar alarm. Somebody would have heard the alarm if it had gone off. Trainham said no murder weapon was found at the murder well, at the murder scene from police uh, at the murder scene and it said police have no suspect the girl work the girls work together at Bethania, Walbrook said. Lisa has rented the house for about a year. Lisa worked about Worked a double shift last night, or she would have been at home. 
She, the murder victim, was at Lisa's quite often. They were real close. It's pretty bad. Uh, she was she was young. It's pretty bad. Uh, let's see. Chuck Vermillion, a neighbor. I ain't never seen anything like this. Another neighbor who asked not to be identified said she heard screaming around 7.20 a.m. today but shrugged it off at first. I thought it was maybe a couple or something. The next time I'm going to look twice, she said. Later, my husband said there was police out there. It's awful. It makes me scared. I've got three kids and I'm going to be more alert. It's cold-blooded, another onlooker said. Evidence shows it's murder. Uh, could have could have started in the living room, but we have evidence of violence in all three rooms, including the bedroom. Man, that's just yeah. I just try. Have you ever like envisioned that shit? I mean, it's just somebody chasing you around, and you can't get away, and you tried, you almost got away, maybe, and it's just ah, uh, terrifying. Tradem said anyone with information about the murder should contact his office. All right, then we go to uh, I think that's the same day, so we'll just skip that one. Yeah. And, and and believe it or not, everybody, this is a new night. I know we had, it was my birthday yesterday and everything. Got to keep on keep on trucking here. It, it also gives me mental juice when there's, you know, we're building up the funds for the my channel and the super chats at the same and the uh, not super chats, via super chats, for the charities. We did five hundred last night, five hundred early in the month and. We are two days after the midway point, and there was some pretty cool news in the Bibb County case, and just in terms of you know what level of um, relatives they've got there. But that's all I can say. <laughs> you know, we'll see. We'll see what it how it turns out. All right. All right. So Terry Lee Sims 20 of 1610, so she actually lives herself at a different location. It's over here. So that, those are the two homes. She actually lives in this house right here. Thanks, Lee D. Yeah, so another house, very similar, older. Actually, let me let me open up the, the previous article at a page two of it. I just want to see. Actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna go over that other article one prior looked like it was more detail thanks Lee D uh, Terry Lee Sims was described by those who knew her as dedicated woman Beedra Wingrove Sims great-grandmother said Sims aspired to be a, a doctor and co-worker at Bethania said she would immerse herself in medical books relating to her work as an EKG technician. Thanks, Tony Lee. But her aspirations ended. Here, I'm going to turn off the volume of that, but thank you very much. Ocean wave. Ocean, ocean wave. wave. Ocean, ocean wave. wave. <laughs> thank you. Uh, the 20-year-old Bethania employee and Midwestern State University student was found stabbed to death at 1509 Bell Street. Major Charles Trainham of the Police Criminal Investigation Division said she was found nude and with her hands tied behind her back on the bathroom floor. So what's weird is, did, he, did she get tied down uh, first? 
And then she tried to run away and she had no way to protect herself or did he like stab her and then tie her? You know, it's kind of weird. She probably tried to get up after being tied. Maybe she broke out of her if she had some foot ligatures or something. The two were close friends who worked the same shift in the same office at Bethania and often studied together at Boone House for classes they took at MSU where Sims was a sophomore majoring in elementary education. Traham said her death was not connected to previous murder cases or other stabbing incidents in the city. Sergeant Grady Smith, a Wichita County Sheriff's deputy acting as medical examiner, and Sim said Sims had been stabbed twice in the back and once in the chest. He said he couldn't detect whether she had any bruises or other marks resulting from a struggle. Tranham said furniture and other items were thrown about the living room, bedroom, and bathroom as if she had struggled with her assailant before she was murdered. It looked as though whoever did it was there for some time because of the extent of the damage which occurred in the struggle. Uh, police said they have not found the murder weapon. So there's the house. I just want to see how similar the other house where the murder took place looks to that picture. It looks like it would have been like this. Now you can you can see it like that window and the, the siding and everything. So it's still everything's the same, just the that camera angle is a lot lower. And of no suspects. Trainham said her body was sent to Dallas for an autopsy to determine the cause of death and if there's evidence of sexual assault. On the day before her death, Mary Hale, a co-worker at Bethania, said Terry was in a good mood and told her she was planning to do some Christmas shopping. She brought two boxes of chocolate and Christmas presents for Mary and another co-worker. Everybody was stunned, shocked. We were hoping it wasn't Terry Sims, Hale said, turning to gaze off in a distance as if the death had still not settled in her mind. Sims had worked at Bethania for two years first as a nurse's aide and then an EKG technician. She describes Sims as easygoing and determined. Although Sims has been living with her great-grandparents for three years, uh, she would occasionally stay at Boone's house overnight, so that's why she was over there. Miss Wingrove said Sims and Boone had been studying for finals at MSU together and that she would usually stay with Boone overnight after extended study sessions. If she studied into the night, she just stayed there, Miss Wingrove said. W.C. Walbrick, Boone's landlord, said Boone had rented a house from him for about, seven, uh, for about seven years and that he knew Sims only from an occasional wave. Uh, she was in shock. Let's see, it's down here. After she, Boone had earlier dropped Sims off at the house after the two had finished their 3 to 11 p.m. shift at the hospital, Boone went back to the hospital to work a second shift from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. and returned from the hospital when she found her friend. Oh, boy. After she calmed down, Lisa's first words were... So she got murdered in between that time, obviously, between 11, and 7 a, 11 p.m. and 7 a.m. Walbrook said he and his wife were the first to see Terry's body. He said the door was locked when he and his wife went to the house. Robert M. Moore, who lives across the street from the Boone house, said he walked outside his door at 7 a.m. before taking his wife to the hospital for a 7.30 a.m. medical appointment. When I walked outside to see how cold it was, I saw a dark, compact car. I couldn't see the license plate and it backed out of the alley or the driveway and drove off. Another neighbor said he saw two men in the vehicle. You don't, you don't never know what's going on, and it's getting to the point that you're afraid to go out and ask anybody. Sims of 1610 Easy Street 
was born May 14, 1964 in Wichita Falls and lived here all her life. She graduated from Ryder High School in 1982. And there you go. I'm going to go to the 23rd. I think that's pretty much the same thing there. Now we're going to the 26th. Slain stu student may have led attacker into friend's house. Hmm. Yes, yeah, so investigators with the Wichita Falls Department still have no suspects in the Friday murder of a 20 year old student. Terry Sims, a Midwestern State University student, apparently opened the door for her attacker on the night she was stabbed to death, according to Lieutenant Collins of the Criminal Investigation Division. The front door of the house at 1509 Bell, where she was killed, has locks that automatically lock when the door is closed. We assume that she let the person in. The door automatically locks when it's closed. Ms. Sims, a Bethania Regional Health Care Center employee, was staying at the home of a friend when she was killed earlier Friday morning. Ms. Sims was found in the bedroom of the house with her hands tied behind her back. She had been stabbed several times. Colin said an autopsy. The body is not complete. And then this uh, preliminary results of an autopsy of Terry Lee Sims, 20, who was murdered December 20th, show no evidence that the woman was r raped before her death, police, uh, her death, police said Tuesday. Major Charles Trainham of the Criminal Investigation Division of Wichita Falls Police Department said Miss Sims, a sophomore student at Midwestern State University, died of numerous stab wounds. Pathologists at the Southwestern Institute of Forensic Sciences at Dallas are conducting the autopsy. Trainham said Miss Sims, who was found early in the morning of December 22nd in a friend's home, had been stabbed three times in the back and several times on the front part of her body with a sharp knife. Trainham said he was reluctant to reveal the exact number of stab wounds on the front of the body because that information might hinder the murder investigation. Oh, this says not raped up here. Yeah. Police detectives earlier this week said they believe Miss Sims knew her attacker. Trainham said police have no suspects in connection with the murder. And then it was like two months later. See, now they finally, you know, came up with what was obvious, right? A source close to the investigation into the December murder of Terry Sims said Thursday that she was sexually assaulted, contradicting earlier Wichita Falls police reports that the Bethania Regional Health Care Center technician had not been raped. Law enforcement authorities Thursday continued their silence on both the Sims case and that of Tony, uh, so this is another person, Tony Jean Gibbs, the Wichita General Hospital nurse found dead in Archer County Field last week. All right, then we've got, I'm not going to produce the autopsy report. This is part of the last one. I don't think I have to justify any reason to release that. That's just my absolute right. I have the right to release or not to release information in my office. Maka declined to discuss the possibility of any connection between the two cases. So there's now there's somebody else that was murdered. And this is this is her right here. EKG technician. So she was gonna go out there and Start kicking some ass in the world. Okay, and then we're moving on to, and then the, the name that they just mentioned was, this one had more press coverage than the others because she, you know, very pretty and a nurse, and you know, it's just, you know, the way it works, right? Let me, I'll show you. Tony Lynn 
Tony Jean Gibbs. That's her right, right there. So this is when, when she's missing right here. This is uh, back in January. Uh, Wichita Falls area, law enforcement officials today began scouring the area for a 24-year-old Wichita Fa Falls nurse missing since Saturday. I think it's something police need to watch closely that we don't develop a wait-and-see attitude, Police Chief Curtis Harrelson said. In searching for a missing person, you have to find a balance. It's very unusual for some people to be gone for just a few hours. Uh, we're real concerned about this, he said. While Wichita Falls police crisis, or, uh, police crisscross the area in search of Tony Gibbs, the family of the Wichita General Hospital nurse, pledged today to stay here indefinitely. Yeah, the nurse that's killed. I mean, they, they really had these huge write-ups on it. Uh, let's see. The 1984 Chevrolet Camaro belonging to Miss Gibbs was found at about 10 a.m. Tuesday in the 2000 block of Van Buren. So let's go do that. Yeah. Two thousand. Did I spell that right? Oops. Let's see where 3,000 is. All right, so somewhere in here. Where the Camaro is somewhere right around in there. Now, there was no indication of foul play found in the vehicle, but lab technicians at the Texas Department of Public Safety are processing the car. Investigators hope interviews with acquaintances and neighbors will develop a time clock of Miss Gibbs' whereabouts during the day she disappeared. We've had several false leads that don't pan out, but we don't discourage that. Police are waging an all-out effort to find the woman whose parents uh, say would not have left town without telling anyone. All right. I'm not going to read that whole thing. It's too long. And there's, you know, the same picture three times, zoomed in differently each time. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's see. Uh, Wichita Falls Police Tuesday found the abandoned 1984 Camaro belonging to Tony Gibbs of Wichita General Hospital nurse who was reported missing after f failing to report to work Saturday night. The car was discovered about 10 a.m. in the 2000 block of Van Buren Street in Wichita Falls, where police believe it had been parked for at least 24 hours. Police say they have not ruled out foul play in the disappearance of 24-year-old nurse. Well, I, I, I would say you haven't ruled out, you know, <laughs> it's more likely it's foul play at that point, right? Like she's a nurse, she's not, you know, people tell you she's not leaving. 
And you know, you should look. You, that should be the assumption that it is foul play. Donnie and W. L. Gibbs, the parents of five foot one, one hundred pound blonde woman, arrived in Wichita Falls Tuesday afternoon from their Clayton, New Mexico home. They said their daughter told them she had been receiving scary phone calls for several weeks. They said Miss Gibbs had told them uh, he knows that I've been, he knows what I've been wearing. He knows what I've had on. They also said she had requested but did not receive a phone tap. Hmm. Jeff Gibbs, one of the woman's two brothers and a resident of Wichita Falls, said she discussed the calls with him before Christmas but would not go into details with her family. Hmm. That's pretty interesting. Uh, she said, sometimes they would talk nasty, he said. Sometimes they didn't say anything. If she had been out somewhere, sometimes they would call and tell her where she, wa uh, tell her where she was or what she had been wearing. Oh, interesting. About two weeks ago, she asked her brother what type of weapon she should buy to better protect herself. He said he bought her a can of mace, a spray repellent more than a week ago and showed her how to use it. Still, her father said she didn't appear distraught last week when he drove here to deliver a stereo he and his wife gave Miss Gibbs for Christmas. Uh, her parents said they believe it's unlikely that their daughter would leave town without notifying anyone, suggesting that she up and left is ridiculous. Anyone who knows her finds finds it that way she never went out in her nurse's uniform though there is no way to tell if she was in her uniform we cannot find her rn pin and her everyday jewelry was at her apartment smith said police do not believe there is a connection between the disappearance of miss gibbs and the December 22nd murder of Terry Sims. Right, well, you guys weren't too right about that one. Now the search continues. You know, they're not really stumbling upon any, you know, they haven't found her yet. Uh, one of the motorcycle, let's see, FBI agent Steve Gray said his office was notified by police of the investigation, but said there is little the agency can do unless a federal offense is involved, or they ask, right? Wichita County Sheriff deputies and a Texas Ranger were called to Burke Burnett Tuesday night after part of a nurse's uniform was found on US 240 west of the city, but investigators determined that the uniform had not belonged to Ms. Gibbs. Blood believed found in Camaro belongs to Wichita nurse. Authorities found a small amount of a substance that may be identified as blood inside the car of Tony Jean Gibbs. Wichita Falls Police sent a sample of the substance and Miss Gibbs' car to a laboratory for more tests. Meanwhile, police are using a computer to coordinate bits of information gathered as investigators check out dozens of leads phoned into police. We've got a whole stack of leads they're working on, said Officer Jim uh, Bernethy of the Crime Stoppers program. Calls are being channeled to the Crime Stoppers office. Leads are logged into the computer and the outcome listed. Uh, so they had about, I don't know, 100 leads that came in. Hundreds, join Hunt for the nurse, looking all over for her. And then this is February 16th, so about three weeks, two and a half weeks later. Uh, let's see. The, the nude body of Tony Jean Gibbs, a 23-year-old Wichita General Hospital nurse, 
missing since January 19th, was found Friday by a Texas Electric Service Company employee in a field along US 281 in Archer County. So let's see where... I got my I got a, I got a new uh, keyboard, <laughs> so I have to put these little O rings on there to make it quiet. But those are in the those are being shipped to me. All right, along 281 Archer County. Is that the inside? Oh, there it is up here. But we'll just randomly put one along 281 here yeah I don't know did the bots ever even really work <laughs> uh, let me try it Okay, well, maybe they'll be connected in a minute. <clears throat> oh, and by the way, for, for you guys there, I, I had to get rid of a couple of the our moderators, just to let you know. All right, and what the moderators did was they blocked some of the actual channel members here so that they couldn't be seen on the other channel. And by doing that, it actually blocked those people from my channel because they're moderators. So when they block them, it blocked them from this channel. All right, so, and you know, they were, they were, you know, on other channels being moderators while I'm live and over there promoting their channel, okay? So, unfortunately, that's just the way it is. Now, they're probably gonna reach out to people and go, oh God, this is how gray he is, look at what gray. I don't care, man. Um, I was having headaches for a long time with the very same people. All right, so um, I'm just trying to get to a place where I don't have stress other than my show, you know? I already go through the stress like right now, like tonight's show is stressful because we're, uh, you know, 40-something minutes in and at 1% of the nightly normal goal. And, you know, on this channel, our main goal is to be able to, you know, support all the different charities that we do and help keep me in, in, in existence. So that's what the main stress is on here. And, uh, you know, so if you don't see a few people, you don't need to ask, hey, who was it, who was it? Okay, but if you hear from them, I want you to let me know that you heard from them because it's, it, <laughs> some of the stuff that one of them was writing to me was just <laughs> really crazy shit, man. It was way out there. Hey, thanks, Dana Dane. Thanks, D and K Rack. All right. So, anyways, uh, in February '85, that's when she was found. The new body of Tony Jean Gibbs, the 23. So she was nude too. This individual. Oh well. 23-year-old Wichita General Hospital nurse missing since January 19th was found Friday by a Texas Electric Service Company employee in a field along US 281 in Archer's County. Wichita County District Attorney Barry Maka said the body was identified at, at the site by an acquaintance of Miss Gibbs. I don't know if it's Maka or Maka or whatever said the body will be sent to the Southwest Institute of Forensic Science in Dallas for an autopsy to determine the time and cause of death. Miss Gibbs was pronounced dead at the scene by Charles D. Cox, Archer County Justice of the Peace. The body was taken to um, Ald's Funeral Home in Archer City. We feel it would be our best interest 
in the investigation not to reveal any facts or circumstances surrounding the death because it would perhaps hinder the investigation. So they were already doing that deal where they don't tell you anything. The body was found at 2.30 p.m. by Charles Hayes, a Tesco employee who was inspecting a transformer in the field. Thank you, Kelly Grant. Located off west. Oh, there we go. So now we can get that one. All right, so. West. Road. There we go. I wonder how close they did. That was pretty close. Pretty close. So it's probably a field off of um, right here, right? What's it say? It was inspecting a transformer in the field located off of. So it's right in that area. Cool. I don't know if, if it was right here. What, what was it looking like? Oh yeah, look at that. That's 1995, so it's probably just right in this area. And so now it doesn't look like that at all. But so that probably even prior to that, it was all fields there. So that's where her body was found, somewhere around there. He said he was driving along a trail in the field. So it wasn't found. Uh, he found a, a trail actually leading into the field. Hey, Dennis, I just, let me go through the, uh, the story, okay? <laughs> you're, you're telling everybody the stuff that's in it. We've gone over that. Um, yeah, the... Uh, and so they probably saw like a, uh, a path going through the, uh, you know, the field, and then he track, tracked it down, right? Yeah, nobody's ever heard of this one. See, it's kind of like the cases that I cover, you know? Like, nobody's heard of them. Yeah. So, Hayes said he was driving along a trail in the field, so he must have seen a path where the person drug her out there or drove a car into there when he found the body about a hundred yards from the road so yeah I don't know let's see I wonder if that means something different like like this is the road and maybe a hundred yards off into this direction like let's see Yeah. So I don't know. Maybe it is like off of that highway and then maybe out here. It could even be like right over there. I mean, we don't really know how far down. It doesn't say yet on here. He said the body was nude. Oh, wait. He said he was driving along a trail in the field when he found the body about 100 yards from the road. I thought it was a mannequin when I... How many times have we heard that one? When I first spotted it until I got out of the pickup and realized that it was definitely a body. Hayes said the body was nude, lying face up in the open field. He said the body was not decomposed, but said he didn't look at it long enough to see if there were any wounds. Hmm. It was not decomposed. How could that be? I mean, she's been, she was missing for, like, a month. So he must have, maybe, I mean, I don't really know the details yet because I haven't got to it. But that's pretty wild. She's not decomposed. But what time of year was it? Well, this is also winter, so. And, you know, it could have been very cold out and she just, her body was cooled down or frozen right away. You know, because this is January and February. Uh, it was a pretty good shock, so when I realized what we had, I went out and called the police. 
Yeah, so they cordoned off the area and started their investigation. Here's a bunch of people right there. And then the next day, body of missing nurse found in North Texas field. Same thing. Let's see if it gives a better description. Hazy was repairing a transformer near the site, found the body about 2.30 uh, p.m. He said he saw the body about 100 yards from the road while driving along a trail in the field. I thought it was a mannequin. Yeah, same deal. All right, now we're on to the next one. Multiple stabbing killed Tony Gibbs. Tony J. Gibbs died of multiple stab wounds. Earlier today, District Attorney Barry Macca would say only that she was stabbed. He said, though, there is a good probability she was killed in Archer County. Hmm. The body of Miss Gibbs, a Wichita General Hospital nurse, was found in an Archer County field south of Wichita Falls. Macca, uh, am I saying that right, his name? Dennis? Is it Macca or Maka? Yeah. Maka received a preliminary autopsy report on the death Monday. He refused to divulge any information other than the fact she was stabbed. Wichita Falls Police joined the district attorney in the silence, saying the public release of the information could, could inhibit future investigations. Oh, Maka? Okay, so the first way I said it. Thank you. Uh, the preliminary report was completed Monday by a forensic scientist at the Southwest Institute of Forensic Science. Part of it is purely speculation until we get something written and they, the scientists, get all the tests run. The results remain private. Trainham said part of the information contained in the report. <laughs> well, thanks, Nicole Wilson, for helping out. For the Freak family. Thank you. Multiple stabbing killed. Yeah, so again, uh, another stabbing. Uh, a complete and written autopsy report is expected in a week to 10 days, Train M said. The time learned Saturday that results of the autopsy to that point showed Miss Gibbs had been stabbed and had not been sexually assaulted. Well, that's going to be bogus too, obviously. Maka in conference with Archer County District Attorney Jack McGaffey, or McGaffey maybe, I don't know. Today, earlier today said he would not release the suspected cause of the nurse's death without consent from all investigating agencies. He said there is a strong possibility a trial of the murder case will be held in Archer's County where the body was found. Maka said he does not anticipate a trial soon. Wichita Falls Police have strengthened their in-depth investigation into the murder. Archer County officials, Texas Rangers, and Texas Department of Public Safety officers are assisting in the investigation. Hey, maybe they can go get, uh, dig out uh, Henry Lee Lucas pretty quick. Yeah, try to get him in there. Oh, yeah, so this case was kind of weird because then all of a sudden, look at this guy. Wichita Danny W. Laughlin, 24, was indicted today here on charges he lied to a grand jury on a matter connected to the investigation of the murder of Tony Gibbs. District Attorney Jack McGaffey said Laughlin was indicted for lying on March 8th when he told the grand jury he had not been in to a field where Miss Gibbs' body was found. McGaffey said aggravated perjury is a third-degree felony punished by a prison term of, let's see, of from one to ten years. Laughlin was in Archer County Jail today in lieu of posting bond. Okay, well, it turns out they ended up actually charging this guy. 
And it let's see, Tony Gibbs murder suspect returned for arraignment. You know, so Danny Wayne Laughlin indicted last week for capital murder in the stabbing death of Wichita Falls nurse. Laughlin was returned to Archer County, Archer City from Texas. Department of Corrections, Laughlin likely will be arraigned, have bonds set, and be appointed an attorney. However, Laughlin will not be released from custody because he is serving a seven-year sentence at Texas Department of Corrections for perjury conviction. Wow, what a ridiculous uh, sentence for perjury. Um, a trial date will not be set until after arraignment. So I think he went. He actually went to a trial. Then it was then it was either a hung jury or whatever it was. But they ended up deciding not to try him again. I mean, I think it was kind of obvious by that time. But that was like October sixteenth, nineteen eighty-five, which was yesterday. You know, but twenty-seven years before. <laughs> yeah. So anyways, they had this guy, oh, he's the killer, he's the killer, uh, but he's not. All right, then we're moving to another individual named Deborah uh, Taylor is her name. And again, I mean, very pretty individual there. I think this is newspapers.com. I, think, I don't know if she's in the whole articles about her. Let me, uh, hold on, let me go find, I think I gotta go find the rest of that one. I didn't realize that was the second page of a, so let's see, Debbie Taylor. My keyboard's a lot louder, so I just, I'll have to wait, you'll have to wait. Um, believe it or not, look at it. Oh, my chair's still making noise, but it's not quite as noisy. That's ah, still pretty noisy. I gotta get something. I think that's the one I have, this one. The, yeah, okay, and then go to the previous page, and then we'll have that first part. There we go. Two slain women, women identified. Uh, Fort Worth police added two women's names to their growing list of slaying victims Saturday with the identification of bodies. Police said a woman found in a field near downtown Saturday was Mary Taylor, Thirty-five, whose address was unavailable. She was shot twice in the chest. Mary Taylor's body was found less than 24 hours after the body of Deborah Taylor was found at a construction site in northeast Fort Worth. Deborah Taylor had been missing since Monday after she left her home at 7-2. There we go. So let's do that one. So that's pretty weird. I don't think they're even related. <laughs> I mean, you know, so you think that would be the first thing they would lead with would be, and they're not related, even though they have the same last name. All right, so we're going to go to uh, her home is... Seven one two five Ruth Street. I think this is actually in a different place. That's uh, Fort Worth. Yeah.
so let's see. Deborah Taylor had been missing since Monday after she left her home at 7125 Ruth Street on the east side. Mary Taylor was black and Deborah Taylor was white. Maybe that's why they waited to say that sentence. Police say Mary Taylor's body was found at about 7 a.m. in a vacant lot. I wonder if that one was ever solved. Let's see. Murder of Mary Taylor, Fort Worth, Texas. Where is it? That's not it. Where is it? I saw it. Yeah, victim Mary Taylor. Look at that. On March 30th, 1985, patrol officers responded to the field at 2300 Cobb and found the body of Mary Taylor. She died as a result of gunshot wounds. I'm going to have to pull this page aside right here. Got a new, uh, check, check this one out. Look at all these people. I think I've done, I did this case here. Wow. Whole bunch. Yep, more cases to go over. I guess that one's still cold, that one. that The other murder there, how crazy is that, huh? Deborah Taylor's body was found Friday in a grove of trees near Loop 820. Okay. So. Loop. 820, 800, and Randall Mill Road. Yeah. So a grove of trees, what did this look like a long time ago? Let's see. Found Friday in a grove of trees near Loop 820 and Randall Mill Road. And this is Randall Mill Road and East Loop 820. And that's Randall Mill, Mill Road. I can't imagine that being anything other than the right place. So we'll just say she was found around here somewhere. She lived there. She's found right around in that area. A spokesman from the medical examiner's office said an autopsy probably will not be completed until Monday. And this is when we move over to the, this one. Uh, Ken Taylor, 31, Deborah Taylor's husband, was awaiting the arrival of relatives when he got a telephone call saying that medical examiners had identified his wife through dental records. It's no surprise, he said slowly as he hung up the phone. I knew it was her when I saw her yesterday. She was wearing the necklace I gave her for Christmas and her wedding ring. Family members had planned to gather over the weekend, but under much different circumstances. We were going to plan a party for Sunday to celebrate her birthday and the birthdays of her little girls. Taylor said Jennifer, the couple's only child, turns five Sunday. You know, you know, what's, see, what's interesting about this article right here, part of it, is that, did you notice how um, it doesn't, now it goes into just about Debbie Taylor, where the other Taylor isn't being discussed because, you know, she's a, I mean, I, I guarantee it, this is what it is. She's black, and Debbie Taylor's white. See? And then, so they both these bodies are found, but then all the focus goes in on, on this one, and that's just kind of how it was back then. I mean, now it's a little better, but, you know, it's not way better. I mean, look at Gabby Petito, right? Like, I mean, my God, everybody's covering that thing.
Yeah, got one, yeah, one line. Yeah. Taylor said, Jennifer, the couple's only child turns five. The scenario of her disappearance is familiar. A young, attractive woman, Debbie Taylor, apparently ventured into the city alone. Uh, six of the women who disappeared have been found dead, and one 21-year-old, Angela Ewart, has not been heard from since she was reported missing December 11th. Five other young women, including one in the Colleyville and one in Arlington, have been found slain. And all police have investigated more than 20 slayings at home in Tarrant County, most of them in Fort Worth since April 1982. The discovery of Mary Taylor's body came only a week after the body of Sharon Kills Back, 18, was found at a construction site. And let's see what happened with that one. Let's see. Murder of Sharon Kills Back. Okay, that one, that, there was an arrest made. A man serving life sentence for the murder is waiting trial in a second. Uh, let's see. Curtis Don Brown, 49, has been indicted on the strangulation of Sharon Killsback, 18, who disappeared March 15, 1985. Her death went unsolved for more than two decades. Then police learned in September 2005 that Brown had been linked through a DNA database to Killsback's rape and strangulation. Awesome. There you go. Boom. See, we're getting the answers even on the side cases. You get what I'm saying? Uh, Taylor said his wife left their home at 12.30 a.m. while two or three friends were visiting and she apparently told no one where she was going. Weird. It was unusual for her to leave that late at night, especially without her purse. She didn't even take a sweater, and it was pretty cold, he said. Heather said his wife left their home. Why would you do that? That's so weird. Let's see. Mary Taylor may have worked the streets of Southeast Fort Worth for a living. Okay, so she was a sex worker. But her friends say no one had a reason to want to kill her. Although, you know, she had a husband, right? Enemies? I don't know any she had, said her boyfriend, James Turner, who had known her for 10 years. She didn't bother anybody. She was lovable and likable. Everybody liked the lady. The body of Taylor, 35, was found Saturday morning in a vacant lot. Now we got a better address here. So let's see. At 2300 Cobb Street. That's well, not even close. Is there another loop over here? Huh. That's not even close to that intersection that they gave us. Let's see, does that keep going over here? Randall Mill Road. Yeah, no, that's not even close. That's wild. Unless I'm in, there's two of them. Oh, well. That's Cobb Park. Let's try this again. 30, 2300. Cobb Street. Fort Worth, Texas. That's Cobb PK. That's not. Uh... Hmm. 
Yeah, no, that's not really. The other one was in Irving over here. I wonder if they changed it. Southeast of the white frame house. Okay, so it's saying, so if they lived here, southeast, they'd be over in this direction. Hmm, maybe it doesn't count as Fort Worth, maybe. Now there's a bunch of them. Okay, there's that one, and then that one. <laughs> I don't know, man. That, that's pretty crazy. Because this is her home. Let's see what the description of that was. All right, it says 2300 Cobb Street, a few miles southeast of the white frame house where she had lived with Turner for the last year. So it's a few miles southeast of here. So I don't know. I don't think it exists anymore. Because that would be down in this, down here, you know, like. Yeah, it'd be somewhere around in there. Probably renamed the street after some f famous person, you know. And we're just not going to get to know, unfortunately. Um, I love the woman, Turner said Sunday. She was a good person. Mary was very nice, even though she was a, a sex worker. Um, I make a lot of prostitution bonds, Adam said. Taylor was one of his clients. Less than 24 hours before Taylor's body was found, the body of another woman, Deborah Taylor, 25, was found at a construction site in northeast Fort Worth. Medical investigators expected to determine the cause of Deborah Taylor's death after an autopsy today. She had been missing since March 25th from her East Fort Worth home, 7125 Ruth Street. Mary Taylor was a well-known sex worker on Rosedale Street, Adam said. I made her bond for the past eight or nine years. I used to get her out of jail from time to time. Adam said he knows the clients, uh, even though they use phony names and false IDs. When medical investigators and police can identify a body, they can't identify a body, they call him. Police said Mary Taylor's body was found face down in a field behind a Fort Worth Police Officers Association building. Okay, let's try that one. It should be down in this area, if it's still there. Let's see. Fort Worth Police Officer Association and no. God. Well, let's see. Southeast. Hey, thanks, Brandy Bradford. Fort Worth Police Officer Association. Let's see. Yeah, let's try it. Let's here. Here's what we can do. Watch this.
I'm just trying to find the address of that damn place. What if I put the word building in there? Now oh, it's March 1985. Come on, come on. Well, it says 2300 Cobb Street. <laughs> God. <laughs> yeah, that's the address that went away. Hey, look at I that was great sleuthing right there, you guys. You guys don't understand. It was awesome. Although it was actually just part of the same Ah, come on. Give me this. <sighs> this is April first. Okay, Fort Worth Officers Association Bill. Was found face down in a field. Let me go back to that other one. Police said she was lying face down in grass behind the Fort Worth Police Officers Association. Body was found at about 7 a.m. in a vacant lot at 2300 Cobb Street between... Oh, there we go. Now we can do it. All right, so let's... Um, Let's get that one. So between Vic Vickery Boulevard and yeah, Vickery Boulevard. Hmm. So it does makes it seem like it is over here. Vickery Boulevard and so that's one of the spots. Okay, that's Vickery right here. And then the other address is, or street is Lancaster Avenue. All right, so that's Lancaster. And so what they're saying, okay. Oh, so it is kind of over here. So now I'm just gonna throw that in there because it's between there and then, you know, that's Lancaster. So it's right in this area. And that seems like that's where the police station, uh, the association was. So the, uh, what was it called? The Fort Worth Police Officers Association. I think it's right in that area. Yeah, it's right there. See, so that is the right spot. Even though they're, it's not. They they got the location of their the house way wrong. I mean, it's it's north. Well, hold on. It's west and just. Dead, you know, dead west from, not southeast. It's right here. So that's actually a description right there. Now Cobb Street's probably changed, but apparently it's right around in this area here. Behind the behind the Fort Worth Police Officers Association building. She was clutching a handful of money in her right hand. Her left hand was clenched into a fist. I don't know who killed her, Adams said, but she was not a thief. She wasn't a robber. So she wasn't the type of person that would take something from someone. I wonder if that was a staged, you know, like a signature situation. That's where the body was found. Let me get rid of this. Somewhere right around there. Totally messed up description though. What case is that one again? I 
Yeah, that's not right at all. It's this, it's over here. So let's see. Let's do the address again. Hold on. 7135 Ruth Street, Fort Worth, Texas. Okay, that's correct. Okay. And then she was found right over here. So. Even so, Mary Taylor, who lived... Now it's a different address. What? Hold on. Now I have to go back. Let's see if this makes sense now. So right here it said, Medical investigators expected to determine the cause of Deborah Taylor's death after an autopsy. She had been missing since March 25th from her East Fort Worth home at 7215 Ruth Street. Right? Then it says she had lots of friends in this town. And then this is a whole other article. Well, shit, what happened? What happened to the one? <laughs> okay, let me get to the, This is the one I was trying to open right here. Even so, Mary Taylor, who lived at 1929 Carver Avenue. Oh, that's the other Taylor. God. Yeah, wow. Okay. Uh, medical, that's the other Taylor. So she lived at 1929 Carver Avenue, had been shot twice in the chest. But Mary Taylor didn't meet Turner late Friday as the two tentatively planned. Turner said he wasn't worried. He assumed she was working. I wonder if this is... Um... Wow, so she was a sex worker too. Two women with the name Taylor that are sex workers. That's why this one popped up. This isn't even the same Taylor. I I have this though. You know, now I'm gonna have to let me make a folder for Mary Taylor here. Because hers is unsolved. So we'll do Mary Taylor and then put that one in inside of that. That's uh Baffling. Hold on. So why is this other article the same day? Down here, does it switch Switch it? I don't know who killed her. Oh, this is Mary Taylor right here. Wait, am I just on the wrong Taylor this whole time? <laughs> you know, because I'm looking at this one in here. It says Mary Taylor. Uh, this is Mary Taylor. But let me... Wow, that's so bizarre. So was the other Taylor not a sex worker? Now I have to go back. I'm con totally confused now. Hold on a second. Man. Let me move these into the Mary Taylor folder. Because we're, 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 we're talking about Deborah Taylor, not Mary Taylor. Hold on a second. So you're having them at the same time like that threw me off. 25-year-old woman is apparently unrelated to a string recently. The last murder victim was identified. Deborah Taylor, her nude body, was found Friday by workers at a construction site. Results of an autopsy by Tarrant County Medical Examiner um, Office were still pending while police searched. So yeah, I don't think, I don't think um, Deborah Taylor is a sex worker. It was Mary Taylor, the one that was shot. Okay, so let's let me. I'm just gonna keep that one separate, and maybe I'll 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 cover that one as a separate. Uh, man, that just totally threw me off. I wonder why that showed up in the same. I think what happened was I typed in Debbie Taylor or you know, Deborah Taylor, and then even an article that where where it mentioned both of them. It got kind of I got confused there. All right. Yeah, so that's all there was. There's almost nothing on Let me let me try that other website though again. This See this website here is a really good one for non uh, newspapers.com, but what if she goes by Debbie Taylor? 
instead of Deborah, I mean, this would be 1985 and Texas. So sorry for, you know, throwing her into the sex worker industry there. I, Now, oh, see, it does. It's Debbie Taylor. There we go. Let's see if this is related. No. Yeah, it's, it's just, uh, wow, it's, I'm, <laughs> now I'm like, so is that not her home then? Let me go back to the first one. I got to make sure I got everything marked in here right. So that's her. And the page one was, oh, man, sorry you guys, I'm totally got to go back in time now. Debbie Taylor, Texas, 1985. Okay, there it is. That one. And that was the page prior. So Mary Taylor's 20 body was found at 2300. Deborah Taylor's body was found Friday in a grove of trees near Loop 820. So now I got to go back, put that one back in there. So that was right. Loop 820. There it is, right there. And so somewhere around in this area. Okay, so but let's make, make sure I got the right home now, though. That's the problem. Mary Taylor's body was found less than 24 hours later. Um, Deborah Taylor had been missing since Monday after she left her home at 7125 Ruth Street. Okay, so we got that. All right. So I just want to get that back in the correct order there. So... Uh, Debbie Taylor is not a sex worker. It was Mary Taylor. They were just identified on the same day. And uh, Mary Taylor's case isn't solved. And so uh, Debbie Taylor lived right here. And she was found right around in this area somewhere in a, in a grove of trees. All right, now we can move on. All right, now the next individual's name is Ellen Blah, or Blau, or B-L-A-U. I don't know how you pronounce that. And so here we go. So friends of a 21-year-old missing wichita falls woman said they fear the worst after finding her abandoned car early friday ellen blah of now we can get that one of one six three eight ardath avenue in wichita falls So you can see how close some of these, all these people are living together here, though, right? So. Ellen's house. Okay. 
And there you go. I was last seen leaving a sub in suds at, so she was last seen leaving, she lives there, she was last seen leaving a subs and subs, suds at 4016 Burke Burnett Road. Let's see if that's a Subway sandwich now or something. I don't know what that is. Looks like a, a cleaner. Yeah, that's the place. Subs and suds. That's, uh, she was last seen leaving there. About 10 a.m. Friday, friend said. They said it can uh, let's see her car was found on this oh there it is okay so we can get that too so suds and suds at 4016 Burnett Road where she's employed about 1 a.m. Friday that's where that's when she was last seen her car was found on a side parking lot of the county store at 4430 Four four three zero Burke Burnett Road. So pretty close to there. Hmm. Side parking lot of the county country store. Hmm. So not sure which one is which. Maybe right here. Maybe this one. Okay. So that's where her car was found. So that's that's weird, right? It's almost like she got out of work and was abducted from her vehicle because she got off really late at one and then at some weapon controlled her probably even brought her somewhere around in here and you know probably assaulted her but then maybe even just you know what he, he probably had his car parked somewhere around in this area he abducts her from there takes her somewhere else kills her dumps her body drives her car back parks it here then he walks to his vehicle, which is parked somewhere down there somewhere. It could have even been over here, but he probably wouldn't have parked at the exact place that he abducted somebody. But So if, if this is where she worked, she's missing and her car is there, and that means somebody abducted her here, killed her, dropped her, dumped her somewhere, then drove the car and put it back here, then went back to their vehicle at some other location. All right. Wow, it's just about time for a vacation, you guys. We gotta gotta get going. Yeah. You guys ready? <laughs> Let's see. Unfortunately, I only have this old one here. We'll have to go. We'll have to switch it to something else. I don't have any other way, anything else to do. We'll have to do like a skiing, uh, some other thing.
Yeah, it sounds like Dennis lives right in the uh, right in the area there. Did, had you ever followed this serial killer? Yep, yep. And this is a time where you guys can help out, support the channel by buying drinks or, you know, just in general. Thanks, Brandy Bradford, Nicole Wilson. There are other freaks in here, aren't there? <laughs> Thank, thanks again. Amber Maiden. Thank you. Yeah, we're going to have to get rid of the couple of these things. The horse one, the... Mankini, no way, man. Thanks, living it, as in living a dream. Tropical dream. Yeah. Well, the horse was funny on the show, but maybe not in the... Uh, The dancing taco. Ocean wave, ocean wave, ocean wave. Bum, 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 bum. Mankini. <laughs> yeah. That's what Zozo always says, living it. Yeah, I'm going to have to get rid of that one. Switch it to something else. That was just made specifically for somebody who wanted it. I don't know. I didn't think they made any expressions. They were just like, yeah, yeah, whatever, a horse. That's what was funny about it. They're like, yeah, yeah, you know, horse. Nope, no poles, no poles. Thank you, Lee D, Candily, Woodward Stone, and your Gypsy. Thank you. Yep, it'll all help out. Like I said, 40 to 50% of the net revenue goes to crime-related charities. And then, of course, I, you know, the channel makes revenue too because I need to be able to justify to keep doing this every single night. The Dancing Taco. I guess I always get this, uh, like, Camarones, Camarones con asada, you know, the shrimp and chicken, but now it's just asada. Boring. I just want to hear her say, supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. <laughs> wow, it said it perfectly. Did you hear that? Wow, they must have had that one dialed in or something. <laughs> she said it perfectly, though. That, that was crazy. <laughs> yeah. 
Thank you, Michelle Sakura Griggs. Wow, that's a that's one of the first things that uh, was ever read correctly by the. I mean, it's really poor at some stuff. Like LOL, it says LOL. Jenny Penny was funny sometimes when she'd type in stuff like, uh, like knowing how it would say it. Those are those are always funny. Are you talking about a new uh, emoji? Can you do your own? I don't know. No, I can't. They use this like one of the voice reader library things. Well, yeah, it would do it that way, but it's still like, shouldn't Streamlabs know that LOL preceded by a space and another space is going to be LOL, not LOL? I think it should be part of their algorithm. All right, anyways, you guys, I am going to go back off. Thank you for the mini vacation there. Thank you, Kimberly Hennessy. Yeah, well, that's how... Oh, there it... Ooh. Hold on. Did that get back there in time? <laughs> oh, shoot. <laughs> I think I blew that one. I'll do it. L O L testing. Did that work? Yeah, I think I didn't switch back in time. Sorry about that. How about L O L testing? Wait, that's gonna work. There we go. Let's see. Here we go. Here we go. Here it is. LOL testing. Yeah, so you gotta have this space. Yep. <laughs> so it worked. LOL. LOL. LOL testing. Not the greatest. LOL testing. Okay. So. We are going to uh, get back to it. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Let's see. So, again, remember, car was found just down the road from, uh, yeah, so she worked at Subs and Suds, and then her car is found there, so she was obviously, you know, either... The killer was already in the car. There's a couple things. With her and had her pull over here because that's where his car was. And then took her somewhere else in his car and dumped her and left the car there. That's a possibility. Or he took her car and took her somewhere, dumped her body, then drove her car back here to get back to his, which would have been parked somewhere around in the area, but I kind of like that first one a little bit, that he had his car there, and then he abducted, drove her to here, and then transferred her maybe to, but that's a lot of stuff. You don't like to, you know, I would, I would, what does that say? I wouldn't say that these, uh, like a serial killer would like to, um, like be transferring bodies a lot, you know, so it seems like you'd want to take the first vehicle somewhere you know, not not take her out, put her in another car, and then move it again, her again, right? What do you think? Uh, 
Uh, Larry Fleming of Wichita Falls, a friend of Blau, gathered with other friends at the Ardith Avenue house Saturday evening to organize a search party for the woman. Uh, she got off work early Friday and was heading towards Ardith. That's the last anyone seen of her. Early Friday, a friend recognized the abandoned green Volkswagen Rabbit convertible next to the country store close to Shepherd Air Force Base. Um, we went out there, said Fleming. The car was parked on the side. The keys were in the purse. The keys were in it. So the keys were in the car. Her purse was in it. Man, see, that makes you think somebody was in that car and had her drive to that spot. The shirt she had been wearing the night before was in it with a broken beer bottle and a trace of blood. Hmm. Miss Ball said the blood was a small drop on the edge of the seat. We called the police about 10.30 a.m. She was very responsible. We can't figure it out. It's just a mystery to us, Fleming said. The parents of the young woman live in Shelton, Connecticut, and are expected to be here Monday. Wow, what a nightmare for them. Uh, anyway, yeah, so right now they're looking for her. Uh, the search for a 21-year-old missing city woman was at a standstill today after investigators said they are back to routine checking and rechecking. Uh, let's see. Friends said the car, which was found at the country store at 4430 Burke Burnett Road, Burke Burnett Road uh, contained the shirt she had worn the night before, broken glass, and a blood spot on the edge of the seat. Her purse and keys were also in the car. Uh, police searched the area Sunday and Monday, and as, as did friends, and no clues were found. She said her husband, let's see, uh, Miss Blau's mother, Rima Blau Shelton, Connecticut, said she is exhausted, but said she is anxious, anxiously awaiting for any information on the search for her daughter, she arrived in Wichita Falls Monday afternoon. I'm just trying to understand everything, she said. She said her husband was not able to make the trip because someone had, had to stay to operate a business. She's not sure how long she will stay, but she said she hopes her decision to travel home will come after Mrs. Blah is found to be all right. Is it Blau? Is that how you say it? It can't be. I don't think it's Blah, right? I mean, or Blow? Blah? I mean, I don't know. Like A U, right? Blue? No. Yeah, I don't know. Jeez. I'm for what? I'm for Gray Hughes and this. Ellen Blah's mother clings her hopes. That's her mom right there, obviously. Rima Blah said she refuses to believe anything bad has happened to her 21-year-old daughter. Miss Blah, who arrived in Wichita Falls Monday from Connecticut to await word on her daughter's whereabouts, found it easy, found it easy despite her worries to discuss the young woman's character and personality. Oh, Blah, you sure? Sure about that? She's very practical by nature. She has a, that sounds more, makes more sense of it's Blau. I think that was one of my guesses, but she knows the meaning and purpose of doing a job well. She was a, she was an A student in high school. Miss Blau, a part-time student at Midwestern State University was last seen leaving the restaurant at 4016 Burke Burnett Road at 1 a.m. Friday. Her abandoned green Volkswagen Rabbit was found at 10 a.m. Friday. Uh, so what day was that? At yeah, 1 a.m., so it was found nine hours later. At a parking lot at the country store, 4430 Burke Burnett Road. With her purse, her keys, and the shirt she was wearing. Man. 
A broken beer bottle and a blood stain were also found in her friend's, uh, her, was also found, her friend said. Three searches in a field off Puckett Road near where the car was found, two conducted by police and one by Blau's friends, proved fruitless. Miss Blau, who is staying with her daughter's roommates, Danny and Janny Ball, said she didn't want to stay in the absolute vacuum of silence. Her 23-year-old son is staying with her husband in Connecticut. He's taking it very hard, she said of Miss Blau's father. It's a sense you try not to think about the worst. It's very difficult to imagine. Um, we as human beings protect ourselves from the emotional catastrophe, the emotional breakdown. Tuesday night, the ball's phone rang often with calls from relatives and friends offering comfort. Four mutual friends stopped by to see if they could do anything to help. Miss Blau's cousin, Kathleen Beller, a former actress on the ABC television show Dynasty, called the Los Angeles Police Department for advice. Um, a detective she knew called a Wichita Falls po police to see what he could find. He said her brother Andy called her. to see if, if she knew someone in the L.A. circles who would know anyone in Texas. Ms. Ms. Blau moved to Wichita Falls, Falls three years ago from her family's former home in New Jersey. She wanted to live near a boyfriend who was living with his brother who was stationed at Shepherd Air Force Base. The relationship lasted about six months, but Ms. Blau already established with a new circle of friends, decided to stay in Wichita Falls for a, for a while, and then eventually moved to California. Ms. Blau said that though she and her husband, Murray, wanted her daughter to attend college immediately, she said there's no sense in going to school and being babysitted until I know what I want to do. That's pretty wise right there. I wouldn't go to college until you're ready to do it. I wouldn't... <laughs> It's a complete waste of money, you know. I know that from my own experience. Uh, Mrs. Ball described her friend as the type who could tell you anything about anything. For instance, uh, that's, I guess that's one of her roommates. For instance, she could tell you the name of every bone in your body. Miss Blau was living temporarily with the balls until she could move to her new apartment. She was supposed to move last weekend. Uh, hmm. Yeah, so anyways, it's just, uh, you know, right at this point she's missing. Uh, then, <clears throat> let's see, Wichita Falls Police said, that's her car right there. It's not colored, obviously. Yeah, and that says, Law enforcement officials said Sunday that Thursday they will release the identity of a body found in a field off Burke Burnett Road if identification is confirmed. Let's see. Is that what this road is? Because that's exactly where... I mean, that's... This is it right here, Burke Burnett Road. So we don't know exactly where at this point, but that's the same exact road of Subs and Suds, the county store. Law enforcement officials said Sunday that Thursday they will release the identity of a body found in a field. Uh, and this is October 14th, so about two weeks later from those last articles. The body was sent to Southwest Forensic Institute in Dallas Thursday. An autopsy report takes 10 to 14 days. Because of the advanced de decomposition of the body, it is not identifiable, he said. I have nothing to go on. And so this is like late summer months, so yeah, a lot quicker decomposition. Police are considering the possibility that the body is that of Ellen Blau, 21, who had been missing since September. Considering it, sounds like it's pretty clear. We cannot speculate, Brewer said. We need to build this on solid ground. 
Miss Blau was last seen about 1 a.m. Friday, September 20th at the Pizza Inn. Oh, so that's a little different. Uh, Pizza Inn at 4014 Burke Burnett Road after she left work at Subs. Oh, so it's right next door, though, that pizza place. Because it's four zero, it's probably that place right there. Because it's four zero one four, and I, I bet you anything that's still a pizza place. Because I can just tell by look, looking at the outside. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Deli Planet. Oh, you got what? <laughs> you guys got rid of your damn pizza joints? All right, hold on. Four zero one four. Oh, no, 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 no. 4014. Oops. 4014. Why did it type in a 401? I don't know. If that's 4016, how could that be 4? I don't know, man. It should, should be right there. That's 4016. Wouldn't that just be the next door place? This doesn't make any sense right here. Like right in the middle of a road. Yeah. Yeah, no. Nah. I bet money that that's it right there. It's literally right next door to it. And that would make sense. Just two di digits off, right? So she gets off of work here and then goes into a pizza place. Come on, Zozo. Jesus, that's not, yeah, that's tacky. All right, 4014. I'm going to say that that's what that is. Although, what's this place? See, it's 4,000. See, and it's on this road, so the other one didn't make any sense. And where's W-H-E-R-E, -E, by the way? Yeah, so this is 4016. That's going to be 4014. I don't care that they told me to put it out here. That doesn't make any sense. So... <clears throat> And it wouldn't be on this side because that would be the odd numbers, right? Okay, so police are considering the possibility that the body is that of Ellen Blau, 21. Miss Blau was last seen about 1 a.m. Friday, September 20th at the Pizza Inn at 4014 Burke Burnett Road after she left work at Subs in Suds at 4016 Burke Burnett Road. Her abandoned car was found by a friend at the country store at 4430. All right. And three days later, Blau's body positively identified. Uh, let's see. A body found on October 10th in the field of Burt. Burnett Road has been identified as that of 21-year-old Ellen Blau, Wichita County Sheriff Bill Burrow said. Let's see, a body found October 10th. Here, let's let's try to let's look at something really fast. I'm gonna go back to that same newspaper, and then I'm gonna put in. Uh, Oh yeah, you have to have a name on here though. God, it sucks.
Yeah, so she wasn't in here. Hmm. Okay, so this is when it was found. This is the next reported day after it was found. I didn't have this one. Oh, here we go. So, yeah, I should have. Let me, let me clip this one out of here. I need this. He does have a weird name, doesn't he? Pretty crazy. Maybe that's why he's a serial killer. Farian? Man, you'd be born with that one. You're going to turn into a whack job. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, second your parents name you Farian. Right, Dennis? I mean, if somebody named you Farian, wouldn't you have turned into a serial killer? I mean, you'd have no chance in school. Oh, there's good old fairy. He's, uh, you know. Yeah. All right. The partially decomposed body was found by Wichita County Road crewmen about 1.40 p.m. Thursday in a field off Burt Burnett Road. But officials refused to say if the body is Ellen Blau, 21, last seen on September 20th. In the event it turns out to be Miss Blau, we wish to be um, certain, said Mike Brewer, Wichita County Sheriff's Department Chief Deputy, Ms. Blau's roommates, Janie, or Janie and Danny Ball, were asked to come to the Wichita Falls Police Department Thursday afternoon, where they were uh, told a body was, was found. I was in shock at the time. Hold on a second. Thanks. <laughs> It was too bright. <laughs> okay. Uh, in the event it turns out to be Miss Blau, we wish to be certain. Um, I was in shock at the time, as Miss Ball said, of her, her voice shaking. Uh, let me get to the second page. I'm trying to get the exact spot for this. I can see a picture of it there. And that looks like a, an ambulance or something, you know. And I just can't tell. You know, it's really crappy pictures the body was taken directly to Southwest Forensics Institute in Dallas officials said the body was found under a mesquite tree about 20 feet from a barbed wire fence on East Road there we go that's what I was looking for that's what I was looking for okay So here we go. We're go here we go. We're going down. Wow. Look at that craziness. So that's where the the store parking lot where her car was found and then he took her to East Street right here and underneath a birch tree on there somewhere. Yeah. That's East Road though. Is there an East um 
So it's got to be the one, though, right? I mean, it's right there. No, it is. It's East Road. So that's it. Yeah, so then her body was found on here. Under a birch tree. Come on, be a street view on there. Oh my god, we got lucky as hell. For once. Oh, that's, is that what these are right here? Birch trees? These things on the right right here? Like, like that? Is that a birch tree? Yeah, and I can kind of see like a, I don't know if that's a mountain or what I'm really looking at there. Here, let me go further down this. Okay, that's what those are, birch trees? Okay. So, yeah, that's the end. It's not going to be that direction. It's going to be in... Looks like this camera got a shot from up high. It's weird. Or from way down the road. I think it might have been like they took... Here's what they probably did. This was probably yellow taped off, and they took this shot from right here, right off the main road. You know how that goes. They're going to tape off the whole road so nobody... Oh, yeah. Boom. There it is. I just can't see in the distance that mountain. or whatever. If that's a mountain or not, but... I think that they're probably you know, right around in this area. And oh, let's see, back, it looked like a little better, this, like that. Man, they got like four dates here, it's crazy. Yeah. So, I mean, I've got that picture and that picture. I can definitely see that that could be it. I mean, what you're seeing here is an ambulance and a whole bunch of co cop cars lined up in a row. And then the road looks like it sort of dips and then back up a little bit. Is there? Does it go on the other side? No. So, it's, it's around where I've got it there. You know, it's hard to really know 100%. Unless it gave you like 400 feet in and... Official said the body was found under a mesquite tree about 20 feet from a barbed wire fence on East Road, a dirt road off Burke Burnett Road. There was some decomposition, Brewer said. It would, he would not say if the body was clothed. He would not say whether the body was that of a male or a female, but did not correct reporters who referred to the body as she. We do not wish to comment on that at this time, he said. He said jewelry was found on the body, according to Miss Blau's friend, who wore jewelry including a necklace with praying hands. They said she inherited the necklace from her grandmother. Friday, uh, Friday said she and his brother searched the area where the body was found a week and a half ago and did not see anything out of the ordinary. Interesting. Another searcher said she and about 15 other people searched the same area about two weeks ago and came up empty-handed. Huh. See, and that's kind of weird, too, because remember the other body was found not decomposed after a month? Brewer said the crewmen who were moving grass on the sides of the road 
were on high tractors that gave them better visibility of the area. Miss Blau was last seen at 1 a.m. Friday, the 20th, at Pizza Inn, 4014 Burke Bennett Road, after she left work at Subs and Suds, right next door at 4016 Burke Burnett Road. Friday discover, uh, Friday is the name of a, a person, like Joe Friday, you know. Friday discovered Miss Blau's abandoned car at the country store 4430 Burke Burnett Road about 10 a.m. the same day while on his bread route. The car was unlocked and contained her keys, purse, and the shirt she was wearing when she left work. A blood stain and a broken beer bottle were found in the car. Because of the area where the body was found is outside city limits, the Wichita County Sheriff's Department will take over the case. If asked, Wichita Falls Police will be available to help the investigation. If we are asked to assist, we will, uh, let's see, we will in any way we can. Uh, Maka could not be reached for comment Thursday night. Ms. Blah, who had worked at Subs and Suds for three months prior to her disappearance was a part-time Midwestern State University student. Okay. And you know, on no in November they were still waiting Ms. Blau's body was found in a field off Burke Burnett Road. A preliminary report sent to officials here October 17th determined Ms. Blau died of undetermined homicidal violence, but officials hope that a completed report will be given them further will give them further clues. The preliminary report is sketchy, he said. Brewer said that Ms. Blau's autopsy is one of hundreds to be completed at Southwest Forensic Institute. Brewer said his department is investigating the case with just as much intent as when the body was found. So far, he said, his department has found nothing outstanding to point a finger at anybody. All right. Well, that's four, four individuals with no person, uh, you know, nobody even in their crosshairs of any kind. And then we've got Tim, uh, excuse me, Tina Kimbrew is what I meant to say. Tina Kimbrew, police investigate city woman's death. Uh, let's see. Uh, police are investigating the death of a 21-year-old woman who was found beaten and strangled, a little different M.O. than the stabbing from the floor, at her Wichita apartment Tuesday afternoon, the body of Tina Elizabeth Kimbrew was found by her grandmother, Mildred Kimbrew of Vernon, Texas, and a cousin at about 4 p.m. Tuesday, according to police. Miss Kimbrew, uh, let's see, where was she found? Beaten and strangled at her, so she lives at 3706 Seymour Road. And this is where she was found. Wow, that's not far from here. You can tell by the speed. No street view there, but you can see, see it pretty good with the 3D, three-dimensional look there. Let's see, Miss Kimbrew lived at Park Regency Apartment number 105. I wonder if I put that in there. Okay, 
I guess that's... Yeah, that's the, that's the right one right there. A member of the family said Miss Kimbrew was shopping in Wichita Falls when she stopped by to visit her granddaughter. When Miss Kimbrew did not answer her door, her grandmother used a spare key to enter the apartment where she found her granddaughter's body. Pruitt refused to comment on the condition of the body or the apartment, but Miss Kimbrew's cousin Shane Kimbrew of Iowa Park said police told the family the room was in a shambles and that Miss Kimbrew was beaten and strangled. Part of the nightgown she was wearing was ripped apart and a billfold was found near... No, yeah, billfold was found near... Uh, huh, that's interesting. I mean, that's probably... Uh, looks like I got cut off on that one. I didn't get to... Uh... Let me go find that. Hold on. Man, I hate that. So her name is, uh, full name, Tina Kimbrew. That would have been 1986. Let me do the full date. 05, 06, 1986. was on May 7th, apparently. Maybe that one. Okay, there it is. So the next page. So I wanted to hear this. Part of the nightgown she was wearing was ripped apart and Billfold was found near... Near the body, Shane Kimbrew said. Pruitt said the body was being sent to Southwest Forensic Institute. There is some question about her demise, and that's why we are seeking an autopsy. Pruitt said police do not have any suspects. Two of Miss Kimbrew's neighbors, Cindy Peterson and Carol Morris, said they occasionally spoke with Miss Kimbrew, who often walked her black toy poodle, Nicole, on the grounds around the apartment. Both said Miss Kimbrew lived alone. She was sweet, Miss Peterson said. She was a, rel a really nice girl. Miss Kimbrew was a waitress and bartender at the Baron's Lounge. Well, let me get a picture. I think that might, I think that's, that's her, yeah. That's her right there. I know it's tiny, I can't make it any bigger, but that's her. Two of Miss Kimbrew's neighbors, Cindy Peterson and Carol Morris, said that. Okay, well, I already read that part. Let's see. Shane Kimbrew and Miss Kimbrew had lived in Vernon, Texas, and then Odessa. Tim Nardi, general manager of the Sheraton, said Miss Kimbrew was hired two months ago and worked at night. He described her as a good and kind employee. She was funny, a nice girl, a jokester, Nardi said. This is such a shock. You don't think about these things until they happen in your own backyard. Miss Kimbrew, Kimbrew is the daughter of Elaine and Robert Kimbrew of Vernon. 
Miss Kimbrew Kimbrew is recovering from back surgery at a Wichita Falls hospital, and her father came to Wichita Falls Tuesday upon hearing about his daughter's death. Kimbrew described his cousin as a really nice girl. Police look for man and woman's murder. Police are looking for a man who witnesses said visited a 21-year-old Wichita Falls woman at her apartment five hours before she was found strangled and beaten to death. Witnesses said they saw Tina Elizabeth Kimbrew let a man into her apartment, number 105, Park Regency Apartment, 3706 Seymour Road, about 11 a.m. Tuesday. Her body was found at 4 p.m., that day by her grandmother and cousin. The nightgown she was wearing was partially ripped from her body, a relative said, and her apartment had been ransacked. According to a police report, Miss Kimbrew was bruised on the neck and face, the report said. She died between 11 a.m. and 4 p.m. The man being sought is described as white, six foot two, Uh, tall and lanky. He is described as having dark hair and was wearing a blue and white baseball cap. Homicide investigator Sergeant Weil Hobson said. We'd sure like to talk to him, Hobson said. Hobson said homicide detectives had interviewed seven people, mostly friends of the victim, by Wednesday afternoon. He said police scheduled several other interviews with acquaintances. We do not have one specific suspect. Police Chief Curtis Harrelson said Miss Kimbrew's body was sent to Southwest Forensic Institute in Dallas. There are several leads to to be followed up on, Harrelson said. Hobson said he hopes police will have the autopsy report within the next six or seven days. Yeah, so let me, um, I'm going to, I'll change all the colors to where the bodies were found. Although I don't think I have Terry's. In. Well, no, she was found in her home at the home. So hold on. So we'll make it uh, like red. Okay, the ones that are red there. That way you can just see on a map. And one of them is in a different city. So there you go, there's the four in this city. One, two, three, four. It's not a very big city, Wichita Falls, you can tell. I mean, what is there, 15,000, 20,000 people maybe, 30? I don't know, it doesn't look too big. I mean, the entire, let's see. I mean, you know, it's not even, I'd say six mile You know, diameter even. It's not even that. You know, if you started in the middle, maybe three, three, half, you know, half mile that way. Oh, there's 100,000 there? That looks tiny. I guess you guys are packed in like sardines. Or maybe it extends way out there. It looks tiny to me. Like Corvallis, Oregon looks sort of similar. Maybe it's more like Eugene, though. But yeah, I mean, look at everybody's packed in. Look at that. <laughs> Man, you guys are like uh, sardines over there. 
But you know, maybe it includes like a this whole area over here though too. Looks so much smaller. Yeah. It's weird. Alright. I don't know. I, I don't live there, so. I guess Dennis lives there, though. He just gave, gave, us a, gave away where he lives, man. Ooh, he's, he's gonna get looked up now by a bunch of psychos. Uh, Wichita Falls man was arrested. So this is four days later. A Wichita Falls man was arrested Saturday in Galveston, Texas in connection with the murder of a 21-year-old woman last week. Farian E. Wardrip, 27 of 23. And look, like he just lives right in the middle of all this crap. I mean, he's right there. Look at this. That's where Ellen, yeah, one of the victims' home was. Uh, he lives right. He lived right here at the time. Okay, so that's that that address right there. And that's where his his address was actually listed as that. And uh, well, well, let me just type it in. Hold on. Twenty three one one. Yeah, right there. That's where his, what his address was in 1986. And so that's this time. 1986. Yeah, so Farian E. Wardrip 27 and 2311 Holiday is, a, is in Wichita County Jail. And that's, that is his address, right? After being charged in the death of Tina Kimbrew, bond was set at 75000 Kimbrew's body was found May 6 in her apartment at 105 Park Regency Apartment 3706. Wardrip was arrested at a Galveston motel room after officers responded to a suicide threat. According to an affidavit, he gave police a statement to do a suit. He gave police a statement concerning the Wichita Falls case, the affidavit said. A murder warrant was issued by William Williams at Wichita Falls. Officers picked Wardrip up and drove him back here Saturday. Detective Steve Pruitt said Wardrip told him he had gone to Galveston to see the Gulf of Mexico. Sergeant Weil Hobson said, however, that the investigator investigation was not over and details of additional evidence or Wardrip's relation to the dead woman cannot be released. According to the arrest affidavit, Wardrip said he knew Kimbrew and had gone to her apartment the day her body was discovered. A witness identified Wardrip's clothing as that worn by a man seen going into Kimbrew's apartment 11.30 a.m. Kimbrew, a waitress and bartender at the Wichita Falls Sheraton, was found Tuesday afternoon by her grandmother who came for a visit. Kimbrew's relatives of Vernon, Texas, were staying here while her mother was being treated at a Wichita Falls hospital. Kimbrew had moved here three months ago from Odessa, Texas. Public defender appointed, Ward of 27 of 2311 Holiday Road, apartment C, was charged with murder Sunday morning in connection with the death of 21-year-old Tina Kimbrew. Tuesday's meeting was the first between Harris and Wardrip, who requested legal counsel. And, uh, you know, so, I mean, it's so, so public defender is appointed to him. Autopsy confirms the woman was strangled, which is different than his other, you know, the stabbings that he had done. Makes you kind of wonder if he sort of liked this person. And he goes in there and things didn't go right, but he strangled her instead. He didn't stab her like the rest of them. And But he also could have only strangled the previous one because they were, remember how they weren't able to determine how she died? I think that would be pretty obvious if she was stabbed. Yeah. So who knows, maybe he changed his M.O. a little bit. Man in, indicted in Kimberly's death. 
The Wichita County Grand Jury on Wednesday indicted Ferion Edward Wardrip of Wichita Falls for the murder of 21-year-old Tina Elizabeth Kimbrew. So, there you go, he's indicted. Then six months later, he pleads guilty. Wardrip was sentenced, and he was sentenced to 35 years in Texas Department of Corrections early today after pleading guilty to the murder before the 30th District Judge Calvin Ashley attorney said Wardrop 27 of 2311 holiday was to go on trial Monday but he pleaded guilty and he got 35 years in prison for that for the murder all right and then and he man is sentenced to 35 years in the Texas Department of Corrections for the murder of Tina Kimber all right then he goes off to prison and then he goes out to prison and let me open up uh, this I'm going to do the Wikipedia part here. So, in, uh, where is it? Yeah, so he was sentenced to 35 years in prison. He was paroled in December of 1997 and moved to Olney, Texas, where he remarried and became an active supporter of the local church. This is 1997. Okay, so he served. He only served a tiny amount of time. I mean, it's ludicrous, especially for Texas. You know, like he get he's in there 86 and paroled a 35 year sentence. He served 11 years. That's sick. Okay. All right. Then, you know, the story's not over yet. You know, you know how it goes. Then in 1999. Officials link three killings to Olney Man. So this is a guy in Olney, Texas. Now he's living in Olney, Texas. And let's see, I've got his place in Olney. There's Olney. And he lived right here in this house. And he became a pastor and everything. He's just such a great guy, you know. Just That's where he lives in, lives in Olney. And then 13 years ago, women in Wichita Falls were buying guns for protection and avoided going home alone. Four women had been brutally killed in an 18-month period, raped, stabbed, and suffocated. Two of the victims' bodies were dumped in rural fields to be further de degraded by the elements, making it difficult for police to collect good evidence. At least six <coughs> police Agencies investigated the cases. Authorities thought they were looking for four separate killers. But the theory drastically changed Saturday when Wichita and Archer County investigators charged a church-going, paroled, convicted killer, Farian Edward Wardrip, with capital murder in connection with Terry Sims, 1984 stabbing death. Authorities are further investigating Wardrip 39 in connection with the gruesome January 1985 slaying of nurse Tony Gibbs, who would have been 38 today, and the slaying of Ellen Blau. Uh, man, this is just, it's crazy. I think it was a sheriff who uh, put all this shit together, too. He's who was badly decomposed body was found in a field off Burke Bur Burnett Road. John Little, a Wichita County District Attorney investigator, met Wardrip at the at his parole officer's office Saturday morning and brought him to the courthouse where he was charged with Sim slang. Wardrip pleaded guilty in 1986 to killing Tina Elizabeth Kimbrew, <coughs> a waitress and bartender, who was found suffocated in her Wichita Falls apartment. Wardrip served 11 years of a 35-year prison sentence and was paroled in December of 1997 and put on the ankle electronic monitoring system. He moved to Olney, Texas, 45 miles southwest of Wichita Falls, where he married and became a Sunday school teacher at the Hamilton Church of Christ. Little started um, putting the pieces to three unsolved killings 
together. Maybe it was Little, the DA. Is that who you you knew, uh, Dennis, if you're still out there? Little started putting the pieces to the three unsolved killings together no more than three weeks ago, District Attorney Barry Maka said Saturday. Authorities would not discuss the details of new DNA evidence that they say connects Wardrip to at least Sims and Gibbs slang but they said the information would be available Monday. John Little caused us to focus on Wardrip, and we developed enough evidence to get a search and arrest warrant, Maka said, without elaborating further on the evidence. Over the last four years, law enforcement from two co- counties have looked at dozens of suspects. The new evidence came about because of evolving techniques in testing evidence. I understand the major break in the case was that they connected DNA to him, Wardrip. Wichita County Sheriff Tom Callahan said, Callahan was one of the primary investigators in Blau's killing. Charging Wardrip with Gibbs' killing is merely a formality, Archer County District Attorney Tim Cole said. His office has been working close with Wichita County authorities for the past four years to solve these killings. We are extremely confident that we have the same man in Tony's case. We believe he killed multiple numbers of young women. Terry Sims, a 20-year-old Midwestern State University education major and employee at the former Bethania Regional Health Care Center, was dropped off at her friend's house in the late hours of December 20th, 1984. The next morning, Sims' nude body was found in the bath bathroom. Her hands were tied behind her back with a yellow electrical cord, and she had been stabbed 11 times in the chest and back and raped. Tony Jean Gibbs, 23, was reported missing January 19, 1985, after she didn't show up to her nursing job at Wichita Falls General Hospital. Her slashed body was found February 15, 1985, in the abandoned bus shell in Archer County, Texas. She also had been raped. Ellen Blau's badly decomposed body was found October 10, 1985, in a field off East Road, north of Wichita Falls, three weeks after she disappeared from her night shift job at Subs and Suds, although she went to pizza, right? After extensive tests by the Southwest Institute of Forensic Science, the cause of 21-year-old MSU student's death is still undetermined. Investigators said they were unable to collect much tangible physical evidence in her case because her body was in such bad shape. Tina Kimbrew, a waitress and bartender, was suffocated to death in her Park Regency apartment in Seymour Road, sometime before uh, May 6, 1986. Wardrip pleaded guilty to the 21-year-old's killing in December 1986. Family members were relieved that their loved one's deaths might finally be solved. Yeah, so, wow, pretty crazy, huh? And got more to go. We went with what we had at the time. Authorities have arrested a man in brutal rape and slang of Wichita Falls nurse Tony Gibbs. Words to that effect first appeared in print more than 13 years ago. Because remember, the other guy was arrested for her murder, and he didn't have anything to do with it at all. So there he is right there. And see, here's Laughlin. He's the guy that was arrested and almost convicted for Gibbs' murder, but he had nothing to do with it. So it just shows you how close it is, right? Like these, if you get a prosecutor in there that wants to make a case, and there's that bus, that broken down bus shell that she was found in right there. Science catches up to killing. DNA testing traveled 
a long way to the time when Ferry and Wardrip could take a drink of water from a paper cup and be linked to two slangs. The technology available now, so this is in 1999, they were already doing that stuff. The technology available now is so sophisticated that you can take a cigarette butt and stamp an envelope just about anything. And let's see. Uh, wait, no. You can take a cigarette butt, a stamp, an envelope, <laughs> just about anything. <laughs> it can be done, said Mark Sherman, associate director of the DNA Identity Lab in the Department of Pathology at the University of North Texas. Wardrip had been charged in the 1980s deaths of three young Wichita Falls women, Terry Sims, Tony Gibbs, and Ellen Blau. After DNA left on the discarded cup, tied him to Gibbs and Sims, he has confessed to all three homicides, authorities said, and a fourth one. Let's see. And a fourth one in Fort Worth. Four years investigator for years, investigators never tied the three Wichita Falls death to one person. The first time I knew anything about his young, about this young man was when I read it in the paper. But after DNA evidence cleared Danny Wayne Laughlin of Gibbs killing in 1996, the investigation began to move ahead when tests on semen in Gibbs and Sims found they had been raped by the same man. Yeah. See, that's why it's so important to be doing... That's why we donate to Rain so much because they test, they backlog of rape kits, and what you got to do is you got to get all the rape kits tested, uploaded to CODIS, and then you can start linking the serial rapists together because those are the ones that you really want off the. I mean, you want all rapists off the street, but the serial rapists—that's what they do, you know. Like that's kind of their their whole deal. They're, they're, that's why they live. They can't wait. Wardrip Laughlin shared... Yeah, look how weird this one is, though. Huh? After Danny Wayne Laughlin had been tried in his death, in the death of nurse Tony Gibbs in 1986, he shared a section of the Wichita County Jail with Ferry and Wardrip. I mean, yeah, because remember, um, Laughlin, Wardrip admitted, you know, he like called up the police and he was put in jail in 86. And then Laughlin was being tried during that same time. They would have been exposed to each other, said Sheriff Tom Callahan. Investigators at the time said Laughlin knew more than he should have known about Gibbs' death. But retired Texas Ranger... Oh, wow, maybe that was why, maybe. I don't know. But retired Texas Ranger Bill Girth, who coordinated the Gibbs investigation, said Monday that Laughlin and Wardrop possible contact sheds a new light on the matter. Well, how come Laughlin didn't rat him out? That, well, he didn't need to, right? Because he ended up not being tried. Or not being... Uh, set. I, don't know if, I don't know what really happened if he got... Um, <clears throat> like a hung jury the first time because it sounds like they said that they weren't going to try him again so that must mean they didn't have significant you know like a, it was a hung jury the first time or they dropped the charges so they could try him again later at a certain point I don't know Hey, hey, Rob, you see what I'm doing here? I'm covering something else. Did, did you notice that? Sweet. Meanwhile, public defender John Curry threw cold water on plans for an extraordinary news conference in which Wardrip accused in four previously unsolved slangs of young women would have faced newspaper and television representatives. Wardrip told a newspaper reporter Friday that he was eager to talk Notified Callahan on Monday that he no longer wanted to meet with media members. Wardrop 39 cited the advice of his attorney. Curry said he talked with the client for about 40 minutes. The public defender was just named to the case Friday. 
anyways, uh, I thought that was interesting right there. That they were both in the same jail at the same time. And maybe that's why he knew as much as he did. A former only Sunday school teacher who has confessed to four slangs that occurred more than a decade ago has been indicted in the March 1985 killing of Fort Worth mother of two. Farian Edward Wardrip Forty was indicted Tuesday on the murder of charge in the death of Deborah Taylor. That's the one outlier. You know, like she lived in um, Fort Worth, not Wichita Falls. Whom he told police he killed because she rebuffed him. There you go. Yeah, it kind of looked like a dork, so. <laughs> Dennis is giving me these one one word answers here. Yes. No. Yes. 100K. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's great, Rob, but just send me an email or something like that. We're talking about these, so. Yeah, there's all kinds of unsolved murders out there. There's bodies all over the place, okay? Just letting you know, they're, they're everywhere. <laughs> uh, every investigator's worst nightmare is that with, let's see, sheriff investigators link Sunday school teacher to three unsolved murders. So this is kind of about the... <laughs> every investigator's worst nightmare is that within the dusty, yellowed files of an unsolved murder is a pattern he wasn't keen enough to catch. A few simple clues that reveal the method and the monster behind the madness. Sheriff Investigator John Little. So is John Little the one that you know, or the uh, Loft, the the other guy, Mock uh, Macon, or what was his name again? Sheriff Investigator John Little was the last investigator to attempt to solve some of the most brutal crimes in Wichita Falls history. The rapes and murders of three women in separate incidents in late 1984-85. There was Tony Gibbs, 23-year-old nurse, who disappeared on January 19th. Miss Gibbs was known for being friendly to needy strangers, often giving money to homeless people. Her body was found three weeks later in an Archer City field. Terry Sims, a 20-year-old Midwestern State University student. Uh, what was that word? She missed a March 6 late-night study session at a local restaurant. Later that night, classmates found her tied up in friend's bathroom, stabbed numerous times. She was nude and, be and had been sexually assaulted. Uh, Ellen Blau, a 21-year-old MSU student, disappeared after work at a shopping center restaurant on September 20th. Her badly decomposed body was found in a field three weeks later. Despite the inclusion of five FBI profilers, the collaboration of several county law enforcement agencies, and even a trial, no killers were brought to justice. Sheriff investigators even today acknowledge that their staunch belief in the guilt of Danny Wayne Laughlin, who was seen near the scene of Gibbs' murder, and their suspicion of a handful of other suspects blinded them to the truth. But if little, if little serial killer theory was right, why had the murders stopped? FBI profilers say most serial killers can't fight the urge to kill again. Where had the killer gone? Little spent hundreds of hours examining old physical evidence, interviewing friends of the victims who had long since put the ordeal behind them. Farian Edward Wardrip had found redemption at Hamilton Street Church of Christ in Olney, population 3347, teaching Sunday school. He arrived in 1997 after serving 11 years of a 35-year 
murder sentence for killing Wichita Falls resident Tina Kimbrew in 1986. Uh, word of defense was that Kimberly was a friend whom he accidentally strangled during an argument. <laughs> okay. Uh, Wardrip could have moved... Yeah, you accidentally strangled somebody for four minutes. Wardrip could have moved farther away, but for some reason he chose only. At an emotional prayer meeting one night, Wardrip told the, the congregation that he had just finished serving a manslaughter sentence for driving while intoxicated and killing his girlfriend. Well, no, that's not what happened. <laughs> Definitely not what happened there, guy. Um, the congregation assured him the truth would set him free. And in time, he became one of the church's most respected members. Yeah. Well. Wardrop got a job as a fix-it man. Folks, folks invited him for Sunday dinner. He seemed to have succeeded in reinventing his life until little came calling. From behind, uh, from behind bushes, little watched Wardrop for several hours, trailing, trailing him to the screen door uh, the screen door company where he worked just before he walked inside Wardrip discarded a drinking cup in the trash little wasted no time in retrieving it and speeding back to Wichita Falls from fleshy mouth tissue on the cup forensic scientists determined that Wardrip's DNA matched that of the sample taken from Miss Gibbs body Man gets death penalty. Farian Wardrip, the only Sunday school teacher who has been linked to the deaths of five women during the 1980s, women, uh, was sentenced to die yesterday by a Denton County jury for murdering a Wichita Falls woman in 1984. Jurors took more than three hours to return the death penalty in the December 1984 slaying of Terry Sims a 20-year-old Midwestern State University student. It was the second murder conviction for Wardrip, 40, who served 11 years in prison for the May 1986 killing of Tina Kimbrew. Wardrip admitted his guilt at at beginning of the trial and was prepared for the verdict. It was not a surprise. Because he received the death penalty for Sim slaying, it is not clear whether Wardrip will go to trial in three other cases against him. So he got life in prison for all the rest of those and he was sentenced to death and he's still on death row right now. I don't know if he's been executed in the last week or so, but uh, Taylor was strangled and dumped in a wooded area off Randall Mill Road in Loop 820 Tony Gibbs, a 23-year-old nurse, was found dead in February 1985 in Archer County, and the decomposed body of 21-year-old Ellen Blau was found in October 1985. Yeah. So let's see what the... Um... Man, do I, do I have to do another... Uh... <laughs> Go on vacation again? Man, we've got these, these incredible... It's like living in a, in a desert. Uh, let's see. Although it's it's getting too late now. I'm just going to call it a day after this one. Yeah, so that's his... Um, that's where I got the... Where he lives now. In only 62 years old. You know, the cool thing is there isn't going to be more than one Farian Wardrip. You know? not Wardrip's not even common. Farian I've never heard of in my life, so... <laughs> yeah, we're only a half of a normal night, if you can believe that. But thank you, Nicole Wilson, for the start of a you know, possible wave. Yeah. So let's see what it says for each of these victims right here. Uh, Terry Lee Sims worked as a part-time EKG specialist. Uh, let's see. 
at Bethia, Bethania Hospital in Wichita Falls, Texas, while attending nearby Midwestern State University Sims and co-worker Lisa Boone had finished working their evening shift at the hospital at 11 p.m. on December 20, 1984. When leaving work, Sims rode with Boone to a mutual friend's house to exchange Christmas gifts. Sims was planning on spending the night at Boone's residence on Bell Street so Boone could help Sims study for her final exam the following day. Unexpectedly, Boone received a call to return to the hospital to work the midnight shift. Oh, man. She drove Sims to her residence and gave Sim the key to her apartment, dropping her off at approximately 12.30. At 7.30 a.m. the same morning, Boone returned home after working a double shift in the hospital. After repeatedly knocking on the, the locked front door and re receiving no answer, Boone went to the landlord and was given a key to her residence. When she gained entry, she saw that, she saw that the living room had been ransacked Boone immediately ran back to her landlord's residence, asking for help. Uh, let's see. What is it? Asking for help to find her friend, Terry. Oh, hey. Thank you, Northern Girl. Wait, what happened? Did I just miss something? Oh, wow. That, wait, 95? <laughs> I was like, what the hell is going on here? Thank you very much. I was looking at some. <laughs> I thought it was. I couldn't believe it. Northern girl. Oh, that gets us at about. Uh, we're right there. We're fine. Thank you very much. Very kind. Yeah, I think this will give us a little bit more information on exactly what he did, I'm assuming. I think these last paragraphs of each one are kind of like that. Yep, and don't forget to put the generous freaks in there. Boom, boom, boom. Thank you. Northern gal. And what does that mean? Uh, you know, can you give us a hint? <laughs> Like what state that is, or <laughs> probably not. While Boone was away at work, Sims had heard Wardrip causing a disturbance. Oh wow! So, and went outside to investigate. Wardrip lunged at Sims, and she ran back into the apartment and locked the door. Wardrip targeted Sims for no apparent reason and broke the door down after she locked him out. Well, how, wait, how is that possible when you guys claimed that she let him in? Was that to throw people off in the paper? I mean, he kicked in the door and broke it down. That doesn't make any sense, you guys. Or it makes sense if they were trying to trick people. Because remember, they said... Um, that she must have known the person because she um, the door locks automatically when it shuts. But you guys knew that he kicked it in, right? Hmm, interesting. Wardrip standing six foot six, man, he's tall too. And weighing 220 pounds. Was he, was he really? I thought he was kind of lanky. Grab Sims, five foot three, 94 pounds and assaulted her. Uh, because of her resistance, Wardrip bound the victim's hands with an electrical cord. Sims was estimated to have lived several minutes after the attack was over. Police officers preserved a semen sample and a fingerprint found on Sims' shoe for future analysis. Over a decade later, the print and semen were positively identified to be those of Wardrip. Sims was buried at Crestview Memorial Park in Wichita Falls. Wow, what a nightmare. So they just made that part up in the paper to throw people off. They knew that she didn't know the person. 
Unless they're just stupid, you know? Like, how would you not know that he kicked in? It would be busted off. All right, so this is the one about the nurse, uh, Tony Gibbs. Near the body police found an abandoned school bus where her murderer likely conducted the attack. Authorities discovered Gibbs' clothing inside the bus. Gibbs had initially survived the assault and stripped of her clothing. She had managed to crawl 100 feet before she died. Oh, man. After the killing, Wardrip then abandoned her vehicle after legally parking it at the intersection of Van Buren and McGregor Streets in Wichita Falls, less than a mile from her residence. Four days after Gibbs' body was discovered, Wardrip quit his job at the Wichita General Hospital. Oh, wait, so it must say that up here. Uh, disappeared January 19th. Uh, Wardrip came across Gibbs at about 6 o'clock in the morning after he had been out walking all night. He knew Gibbs because she was a registered nurse at the same hospital where he worked as an orderly. Gibbs offered Wardrip a ride, and after he got in his car, he began uh, hurling her around and screaming at her. He then forced Gibbs to drive down an isolated dirt road to a field. Wow, so she offered him a ride, and then he just went nuts. Uh, two days after her abduction, her car was found within a few miles of the hospital. Wow, this is, not, this is crazy. Uh, Danny Laughlin, 24, was initially suspected of Gibbs' murder because he often rode his motorcycle near the area where she was killed he also failed a lie detector test and made suspicious statements. Laughlin was then tried and though a comparison of Laughlin's DNA with DNA from the semen of the murder scene was unsuccessful and only circumstantial evidence was available, after two days of deliberation the jury was deadlocked which resulted in his release from custody. Since only one of the 12 jurors believed Laughlin was guilty, wow, prosecutors decided not to. <laughs> that's, that's insane. Usually it's like 11 to 1 the other way, right? But it shows you that at least in this case, they, were, they thought through it. Then Ellen Blau, on September 20th, 1985, Wardrip abducted 21-year-old Ellen Blau in Wichita Falls. The abduction occurred as Blau was walking alone to her vehicle after leaving her evening job as a waitress. She was also a student at Midwestern State University in Wichita Falls. Uh, once a, let's see, where we got here? We did Terry Sims, Tony Gibbs. Now we need to do Deborah Taylor next. Two months after her murder, Tony, Tony Gibbs, Wardrip traveled to Fort Worth, Texas with the intention of looking for a job. In Fort Worth, he met 25-year-old Deborah Sue Taylor. In the early morning hours of March 24, 1985, while at a bar at East Lancaster Street, Taylor had been at the bar with her husband, Ken Taylor, but Ken left early because he was tired. Deborah remained at the bar. Man, that's just... Jeez. why yeah. you know it's like why 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 but was it really that weird that she stayed at the bar I don't know Deborah remained at the bar Wardrip approached Taylor and asked her to dance she accepted his request and the two spent time together in the club yeah. he then asked to drive her home which she agreed to while outside Wardrip attempted to make a sexual advance, advances, which were rejected by Taylor. This infuriated Wardrip, and he killed Taylor, leaving her body at a construction site in East Fort Worth. When Deborah failed to return home by the next morning, she was reported missing by her husband. Her body was found by two construction workers on March 29, 1985, 
Let's see. Prior to Wardrip's confession, Taylor's husband was believed to be the culprit. Oh, man. He had passed three polygraph tests, but was still considered a suspect by police. Suspicions about Taylor had destroyed his life as members of his own... See, isn't that just... Doesn't that just suck right there? Sus suspicions about Taylor and it had destroyed his life as a member of his own and his wife's family turned against him. So his family and his wife's family. Taylor was buried at Shannon Rose Hill Memorial Park in Fort Worth. So anyways, uh, Ellen Blau. This is the one that was at the pizza, you know, the two different shops and so forth. On September 20th, 1985, Wardrip abducted 21-year-old Ellen Blau in Wichita Falls. The abduction occurred as Blau was walking alone to her vehicle. Let me see if how close my guess was. After leaving her evening job as a waitress, she was also a student at Midwestern State University. Once abducted, Wardrip forced Blau, there you go, to drive to the secluded area where he eventually killed her by strangulation. See, that's exactly, um, that's the scenario that was number one because there's no transferring. He get, has her get into her car and then has her drive to the spot and then he dumps her body there and then he drove it back where he parked it and then he walked back to his car. Leaving her body in the secluded area, uh, let's see. Let's see. Let me see. What the, let me see. If, that's just my guess. Let's see what it comes up to here. He eventually killed her by strangulation. He stated in a cold case files episode that he had broken her neck. Oh, I'm going to have to go watch A and E cold case files. Wow. I actually was just looking at those. I think those are on like Amazon or. I have to go. Might check that one out. A and E network. Leaving her body in the secluded area, he drove her car back into Wichita Falls and it abandoned it along with her purse. Hey, you see that everybody? You just use logic and reason and there it is. And no, I didn't read this first. Her blood was also discovered in the inside of the vehicle. A county road crew employee found Blau's body in a field in Wichita county on October 10th, 1985. Once her body was found, it was a very, in a very advanced state of decomposition to the point where she could only be identified by comparing dental records. Yeah, so he, he just said how he killed her up in cold case files, and that's what I was thinking, that he probably strangled her. If she'd been stabbed, I think there would have been some sort of signs. And then he also strangled Tina Kimbrew, so he might have changed up his uh, M.O., And then Tina Kimbrew. On May 6, 1986, Wardrip killed 21-year-old Tina Elizabeth Kimbrew, a waitress he had recently befriended. He went to her apartment and suffocated her with a pillow because she reminded him of his ex-wife. Prior to the discovery of her body, neighbors told police that they had seen a white man, six foot two, but he's six six, with dark brown hair and wearing a baseball cap, leaving the complex. Danny Laughlin, who had been suspected in the death of Tony Gibbs, was ruled out as a suspect because he did not fit the this description. A few days later, on May 9th, Wardrop called the police from across the state in Galveston, threatening to commit suicide. Once the police arrived, he confessed to the murder. He was sentenced to 35 years in prison. He was paroled in December 1997, and he moved to Olney, Texas, where he married and became an active supporter of the local church, gaining a good reputation. He eventually got a job at a screen door factory. Kimbrew was buried at Wilbarger Memorial Park in Vernon. So there you go. Crazy, huh? But yeah. Yeah, it always feels cool when you, you know, you predict, uh, you know, this is what I was saying, was right here. 
he abducted her there and then because her car was found here and her body was here then he obviously had her drive out here abducted killed her dumped her body then he drove her car back to this area parked the car and then went back to wherever his car was like he put it somewhere around in this area he would have parked his car so anyways you guys there you go a random serial killer hope you guys found it interesting you know even if you didn't you can be honest and say you didn't think it was interesting but uh, <laughs> you know that's one I'd never even heard of before I saw him I was like wow who the hell is this guy especially the name Therian or Farian Wardrip not Therian Yeah, so you know what's cool is, don't you guys feel like now that you really know pretty well the three serial killers now? Like Ted Bundy, you probably know. Like, oh, wow, yeah, no shit, man. That guy would walk around, fake like he had a fake cast. He escaped from prison twice. He did, you know, did this and that and the other thing. Killed people here, there, and, you know, Oregon, Washington, all that stuff. Hey, thanks, Dennis Stewart. I didn't even I didn't even realize you lived there. So well hopefully it, it you know I, I think I got most of the main stuff. I'm sure there's some crazy more detailed information. I think what what happens is you learn a lot when you go over these cases just kind of you know being able to visualize what's going on, who what's you know I don't know how to explain it but I feel like the more we cover cases just in general, even unsolved ones, the solved ones, everything, after a while you have a feel for patterns and so forth and what's going on. Yeah, his name is totally weird. Yeah. Varian Wardrip. Wow. He, he couldn't help but to be a serial killer with that name. You know what I mean? And he probably got ridiculed all the way through school. I'm just kidding. He was born a shit uh, dirtbag. I can tell you that right now. Nobody did something to him. You know. And you, ha you know how you know that? It's because later on he decided not to be that way. But he didn't care about that before. He just wanted to do what made him feel good. And what made him feel good was strangling women and killing them and stabbing them to death in most cases. Yeah, that, that made him feel good. And so then you also have Ed Kemper, right? Everybody knows Ed Kemper now. The uh, absolute wacko, what he was doing. I'm kind of liking the uh, Sunday Serial Killer. Although it's not as popular as covering um, uh, Brian Laundry on the run for hours. You know, definitely isn't as popular. You can get over 2,000 people watching if you do that. Oh, yeah? Cool. I probably won't end up reading it, but... <laughs> you love it? Yeah, the Serial Killer Sundays, yeah. yeah I'm kind of liking doing some of the ones that nobody's heard of, you know? Like we all heard of... Yeah, the first two were pretty big ones. Uh, we might we might try to tackle Israel Keys at some point. <laughs> that, that one's going to be a pretty tough one. Long. I don't think it'll be one episode. And there's another one named, uh, oh yeah, those that's one that Cairo likes, and then there's one called, um, another one he mentioned called Nathaniel Bar-Jonah, another crazy psycho. I guess maybe every once in a while we can do one that 
isn't solved too. You know, like uh, it's a serial killing, but they haven't caught the person yet. Like you, they know that they're all related. So those are out there too. And those ones would be kind of cool because after we've looked at ones, you know, you'd look at one that isn't solved and be like, hmm, and you could really theorize more after going over all the other ones. Yeah, I don't know. I get millions of emails. So if you sent me one a long time ago, I probably don't have it. If you just sent it, then I, I, then I might have it. So, any, uh, thank you to uh, Lee D, Tony Lee, Kathy Friday Maker, D and K Rec, uh, Kelly Grant, Nicole Wilson, Cat Eye, Brandy Bradford, Randy Bradford, Nicole Wilson, Amber Maiden, Living It, Lee D, uh, Candy Lee, Woodward Stone, Your Gypsy, T T J O Tracy. Uh, Sir Rancelot, <laughs> uh, Michelle Sakura Griggs, Kimberly Hennessy, Nicole Wilson, Nicole Wilson, and Northern Girl with a double cat eye right at the end there. Got us back to somewhat of a normal ish type, of, a little bit lower than normal, but better than uh, it would have been. Thank you guys very much. I appreciate it. Also, I think there was a. Uh, Oh, hold on, I got a uh, Dan Carr with a PayPal for my birthday. And also um, Angela. Well, I'll just say that name. Thank you very much for a uh, birthday PayPal. It was a cat eye. Love it. And then also... Oh, <laughs> and also Nicole, again. Thank you very much, Nicole. You're, you're so generous. Thank you very much. On PayPal, there so it was three of them. It was um, Angela, Dan Carr, and Nicole Wilson. Thank you. Wow, I feel so fortunate. That's what allows us to do what we're doing, you know, because like some some months, um, like when we, let's say my channel brought in 8,000 in Super Chats, right? I mean, 8,000 after they take their cut. Well, then it's, um, you know, then there's tax 28%, so it'd be 60, let's see, 25, that would be, you know, you're, at, you're below 6,000 at that point. And then I'll still donate 3500 or something. But that's because I take some out of PayPal to make up some of the difference, to get it over the 50%, and sometimes bigger, like if you have a goal or something like that. Yeah. So anyways, we're kicking ass, and just, you know, if you're out on here first time or whatever, the, uh, you know, so far this year, like last year was awesome. Remember how happy we were when we donated $22,000? We were just like, are you kidding me? And then this year, though, we're already at thirty-five for the year. And that means probably, so we got three more months. Like we've already got 1000 in this month. And so that means we have all of, this is, what are we, October? So October, November, and December, the final, you know, the, final night of the month so we've got we'll probably be i don't know hoping to be around 37 after this month then then next month will probably get us right around 40 right <laughs> and then right after that the last month you know maybe 42 43 that's nuts right Yeah. And then what would be cool is if we got to like 42 and then you add that to 22, that would be 64,000. 
for 2020 and 20, uh, 21. And then we'd only have to get to 36,000 in 2022 to get to $100,000 in three years. Wouldn't that be ridiculous? And then I'd think back, you know what? I could have paid off a huge portion of my house with that. But hey, you know. <laughs> yeah. I think it'd be pretty sweet. Yeah. So anyways, thank you guys. It's all because of you guys. You know, that's why, I mean, I wish I didn't have to say on some nights, like, hey, you guys, we got to, but I think that's kind of what keeps it going. Like if we, I know some nights people have to, I, I don't, and that, the thing is too, is I don't want anybody to donate if it's going to make you like bankrupt or something. Like you're just like, oh my God, I can't afford food or anything like that. I don't want you to do anything. Okay, just hang out, do what you're doing. Uh, but if you can, then that would be great, you know? Huh? I'm though also, what does that even mean? All right, you guys. Well, that's going to be it. And we'll see you guys uh, tomorrow. I really appreciate you guys' support and... Um, I don't know. What will we be doing tomorrow? Maybe some missing missing person Monday stuff? <laughs> I don't know. We'll see what's going on. It's not hard to find something out there. You know, I'm trying to get, though, I'm trying to get uh, Chasing you know, Chasing Truth to do, um, you know that uh, Janet, uh, Janice Beidelman case that we covered a long time ago? I'm still going to be making a video for Nefarious. I'm halfway through it. But I think that'd be a cool one to go over. That one's really interesting. Remember the one with uh, uh, they were. That's the one that did that long interview with the husband that I got. So that'll be part of it too. We can go over both those parts. Yeah, that that one's a really interesting one. The Beidelman case. You know, it has the timeline of them traveling around, you know, going from house to house. Then they were going to go to a store before going home, but then it turns out the stores weren't really even open, and then all of a sudden they're screaming, and then they're, her and her son's bodies are found the next day next to the car, and then the child's body was in the... Brandon was in the water. And then, you know, we have the dad interview the crazy craziest interview you've ever heard in your life <laughs> yeah i mean you gotta admit that's the craziest interview that's ever existed yeah so they and i interviewed him i think in april this year the husband and when i was talking to him he said that uh, four detectives had just v interviewed him a couple weeks prior. Um, and they flew all the way from Ohio to Texas to interview him. Hey, thanks, Jen H. Yeah, it was Beidelman. Yep. B-E-I-D-L-E-M-A-A. So they 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 were interested in him too, but I don't think he's the person. You can just tell he's about he's about the most crude interviewer on in the history of the planet. I mean, when he's talking about how he would have sex with his wife, he would just talk about it like, <laughs> I you know I don't know man. You'd have you have to hear it. <laughs> it was it was pretty sweet. So we might actually play that interview too. And then just listen to it and just pause it here and there, you know, because it's pretty wild. It, yeah. You guys think that would be interesting? I think that'd be an interesting show, don't you think? Plus, she doesn't do cold cases much, so I thought it'd be kind of an interesting way to get her to try something like that out. Oh, boy.
All right, you guys. Thank you. Thank you very much for being so generous and helping out. Keeping the, the train on the tracks. So we'll see you guys tomorrow. And as I always say, everybody, until next time, be safe out there. Yeah, I've been doing this true crime thing for quite a while now. And yeah. during this whole time, yeah. I have not seen one person that is a crime deceptor, a projector, a certified human lie detector, gonna get ya on a stretcher if you try and play me like an old projector. Crime sector is my nectar. Professor Gray is gonna give, give another lecture. lecture. Crime collector, freak connector, and I'm always gonna be a pup protector. Fool deflector, interceptor, and I'm meaner than a spectre with a vector on his pecker. With all respect, y'all Just remember I have a temple for conjecture I have no agenda I'm no pretender And I'll serve it to you straight without the blender And in the end, I'm gonna send ya On a mission to reveal the true offender Yeah, so I'll just get right back to work Alright, everybody, talk to you <laughs> oh, did you see that? I went right back through that one.
Red five, red five! Everybody's mean to you, right, Gray? What, you talking to me? No, you're talking about yourself. Yeah, she's always mean to me. But you said she's always mean to me. Ah, forget it. Man. I don't even know what the hell you're talking about. But yeah. Yeah, I mean, why wouldn't they be mean to you? You're singing Ice Ice Baby to a song that has absolutely nothing to do with it, okay? Gee, Gray, I was just trying to have fun. <laughs> <laughs> That's 
that's a little too dramatic. Yeah, it was a little bit, wasn't it? Okay, you guys. We'll see you guys later. Maybe check out the old uh, Discord for about five, six seconds. All right? See you guys later. Be safe out there.